Welcome back. Say hello on Twitter, at Richard Serrett. And my guest coming up in this hour says, It's high time we stop joking around and pretending Elvis faked his death, and it's time we start looking for his killer. Steve Eubaney says, All the evidence points to murder in the death of the king and rock and ro- of the king of rock and roll and we'll pour over that evidence over the next 3 hours when coast to coast am continues stay with us Steve Eubaney is an american suspense author who reinvestigates the deaths of famous people using newly discovered facts that debunk historical claims his books deduce that some of history's most famous deaths were actually murders he is the author of Who Murdered Elvis? The True Story They Don't Want You to Know. Steve Eubaney, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. How are you? I'm doing well, Richard. How are you? Very well. I mentioned off the top, uh, Steve, and this is something that you've said to me a number of times uh, in earlier conversations, that it's really time we, we put this nonsense behind us that Elvis is flipping burgers in Kalamazoo because he was murdered and his killer is out there and we need to find him. Well, I would love to think that Elvis is alive. Um, I, I really would love to. I would love that for so many reasons. But uh, and I don't mean to discount the people who think he is, because there's a trace amount of evidence that they're finding. And I was in that camp about a decade ago. But when they look at all of the evidence, all of it, the whole body of evidence, it's kind of hard to uh, to stay on that. You know, in that line of thought. And this is not a this is not a, a popular line of inquiry that that you've embarked upon because you you've talked to me about um, I, I believe you were at a book signing down in in Memphis. I mean we're talking about Tennessee's number one taxpayer at the time, you know their beloved son, not their native son. He was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, but they they consider him to be one of their own, and they do not look kindly to this this thought. Even perhaps even some in in positions of authority in Tennessee aren't happy that you're poking around in this. Well, you know, I think human beings by nature have a tenuous relationship with the truth. Um, <laughs> and anything that upsets the normalcy bias, we don't like. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't like that as human beings, in, irrespective of, you know, uh, you know, what camp you're in. or It's just as human nature, we don't like that. We like to think that everything is the way we've heard it. And in our society today, we've become kind of canaries. You know, we kind of repeat what we've been told. And I think people like that. It's a lot easier. When people start to dig and dig and dig, I think it upsets people because, again, we have that normalcy bias. It's uncertain to us. So um, I can certainly understand um, why that would be. Uh, I'm not the first person, actually, to dig into this. And I was kind of lucky, in a sense, because... um, there was about 30 years of hard digging research before I got into this. So as much as I would like to say that, you know, I'm the all-encompassing expert, I, uh, I'm not. <laughs> I think I just put a logical, a logical, I discovered more evidence, and I think I just put, uh, brought it to a logical final conclusion. Um, there are other people who thought he was murdered as well. Um, first and foremost, his father, uh, he knew immediately, first words out of his mouth according to Dan Warlick, who is the medical examiner's investigator who went to Graceland, said, oh, my God, they've murdered my son. Well, that begs a couple of questions. Why and who? You know. Right, so. right. And we'll come back to that. But but another uh, individual who was sort of hot on the trail of this was uh, a researcher by the name of Jared Parker, and there's a rather gruesome photograph of Jared on the back cover of Who Murdered Elvis, and this is a crime scene photograph Somebody knocked him off. Who was Jared Parker? And Jared Parker was a guy who was, he was on his way to what they were hoping to be an annual Elvis convention. And um, he had bought some letters at auction that um, were written by Elvis, handwritten. And apparently people were threatening Elvis's life and they were revealed in these letters. So here's this guy on this way to this conference to do God knows what and say God knows what, and they got to him. They murdered him. So, um, you know, it's, 
it's hard to stick with the Elvis is alive thing when other people are getting killed to cover things up. <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's no cover, if he's still alive, I mean, these things wouldn't be happening. Uh, not to belabor the point, but I, I do want to come back to you. You told me the story when you were in Memphis and you were at a book signing and there was a, a woman who, who hurled a book at you. But then when you left, I guess it was with your, your publicist or your editor, something happened to you on the way to your car. Uh, two separate incidents, actually. Um, I was getting—I was on television in Memphis, and I was getting off. I was getting off uh, set, and I was walking to my car, and I had this—I hear this person. Are you the guy who was on television talking about Elvis's murder? And I, I said, "Well, yeah." I thought the guy wanted a book or something, and he emerges, and he's gigantic. The guy had to be seven foot tall, dressed in a policeman's uniform. And um, he says, uh, he, he turns sideways, puts his hand, his thumb, on top of his gun, and says, if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't be mentioning any names. So, he put his hand on top of his holster and his gun. Yeah. Well, it's actually his thumb. his thumb. Okay. And he was dressed as a police officer. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I get the hell out of there as fast as possible, I can tell you that much. Um and when we got to where we were supposed to do the book signing, um, you know, I mean, we were all rattled, you know. And I uh, think we went through Memphis traffic at about 100 miles an hour. We get the hell as far out of there as possible. And we get to the, the hotel we were doing the book signing, and, you know, they looked at us and they said, what happened to you guys? And, you know, we told them the story, and they said, you're getting a little too close to the truth. So I have to be very careful what I say and what I don't. And... Um, the good part about it is we're 40 years past this now. So, you know, um, I don't think that any of these people are going to be, um, uh, I don't think they're alive anymore. But I know what that officer was talking about, or the person dressed as an officer, because um, they were friends of Dr. Nicopolis, uh, which was Elvis's doctor. And uh, I, I think he uh, is a very... I think he was a nice guy, and I think he got maligned in history, and I think that that's what they're afraid of, you know. So uh, that that kind of went away. <laughs> Thank God that went away. Let's let's talk about Elvis's last hours in the official timeline, not not the version that you've sort of unraveled, but the the one that has come to us through mainstream media. He visits uh, his his dentist, and you know. Like a lot of rock and roll stars, he kept strange hours. So he sort of his up his days were nights and his nights were days. So he, Elvis, you know, the fact that he would go to a dentist, you know, around midnight is not as strange as it might seem. Although certain people, you know, read much into that. But let's walk us through quickly the official timeline leading up to the discovery of his body on the bathroom floor in Graceland, August sixteenth, nineteen seventy seven. Well, I'll do my best. It's been clouded and regurgitated and twisted, and but I'll do my best. Um, Elvis has a doctor's appointment, uh, and it was, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, if my memory serves me. And he goes to the doctor's appointment with uh, his girlfriend, Ginger, and his daughter, Lisa Marie, gets a filling. Um, and, of course, he was starting his next tour, so he wanted to have all this taken care of before he, uh, you know, before that was, that was uh, he embarked on that. And he comes back to Graceland, um, walks in, and sees the guys who have assembled themselves to start the tour. You know, the people who are going to do the, you know, the the duties of packing or or whatever. And um, walks in, chats with the guys a little bit, goes upstairs, and that was the last time they ever saw him alive. Meanwhile, uh, Elvis has this insomnia problem as so many legendary rockers did do elvis uh, had a pipeline though for for sleeping medication walk us through the uh, sort of the various attempts for him to get to sleep which all failed miserably um Elvis had, uh, you know, Dr. Nicopolis, I don't think he ever got a full night's sleep after he met Elvis because Elvis was up all night and slept, you know, most of the day. And uh, just because he was a horrible insomniac. And um, so when Elvis needed some, some medication or something, he would call Dr. Nicopolis, who would pick up the phone and he would 
call his nurse to administer. There was a nurse on Memphis grounds, on the Graceland's grounds. So they would administer whatever was needed for Elvis to uh, to get to sleep. And they were packs. And they had to take a couple of them to get to sleep, and they were called attack packs. And they were uh, two or three or four pills that he would take to settle him down so he could go to sleep. And um, Elvis really wasn't in charge of his drugs. Um, he, there was a nurse, like I said, there was a nurse on site who, uh, who, who took care of that. So that was the nightly regimen. That's how that happened. And uh, he was having a real tough time going to sleep that last night. At a certain point, he, I mean, he has extended family living on Graceland, like in the back of Graceland, in, in trailers that were at his beck and call. Uh, at a certain point, what is it, like three or four in the morning, he calls one of his cousins, gets him out of bed and says, okay, time to play racquetball? <laughs> yeah, he calls, he calls cousin Billy and his, and his wife, Joe, and, and, <laughs> and says, you know, you guys want to play some doubles. So... Uh, he grabs Ginger, and they go down to the racquetball building, which is, you know, behind um, Graceland. And they play, according to lore, they play this, you know, racquetball marathon, and, and then, you know, that ends. Apparently it ends when Elvis whacks himself in the shin with a, with a racquetball racket. And, um, you know, it hurts enough to, to uh, end the game, okay? So then he plays the piano for a little while. And they depart. Okay. Um, so according to lore, um, Elvis and Ginger and Billy go back up to Elvis's um, to, to Graceland. So Graceland's kind of a house within a house for Elvis. Elvis's lair is upstairs. You know, everything goes on downstairs. Elvis's private sanctuary is upstairs. So they all go upstairs. And according to lore, um, Billy washes Elvis's hair. And departs and you know that's that's the end of the timeline um as far as any witnesses are concerned the next thing they know they find him uh later in the afternoon dead on the floor his girlfriend at the time uh, ginger correct ginger finds him yep. uh and as we'll discover there's something a little wonky with the with the whole timeline but when she discovers him uh roughly around 2 or 3 in the afternoon, his body is almost unrecognizable. Again, according to Laura, she finds him about one thirty, and the timeline is very sketchy. You know, the witnesses involved couldn't agree on the time of day the body was found, where the body was found, or even what color pajamas Elvis was wearing. So, again, it's, it's a little cloudy, a little shaky, and um, she, you know, she finds him about one thirty in the in the afternoon, and Elvis is face down, and of course his heart had stopped beating. So when your heart stops beating and blood stops circulating, your blood settles to the lowest level. Lividity. Just a, right. It's um, it's called liver um, liver mortis. And when your blood pools and you're on your face, your face takes on a, a bluish, dark blue black tint. So when the EMTs are called, uh, you know, <laughs> Ulysses Jones is astonished to find out who this person is because apparently, again, according to lore, he's unrecognizable. They actually thought they were working on a gentleman of color. Because his face was literally black. Yeah. Purple, that's, deep purple, black. Yeah, that's the, like I said, that's the, the widely repeated uh, rumor, <laughs> for sure. It's very difficult to get a straight story, so you have to kind of like wade through the muck and mire of what has been printed and reprinted and regurgitated years and years and years afterwards. So, and this is what has fueled perhaps the the whole mythology that he faked his death because we have so many conflicting stories. Nobody knows what color pajamas he's wearing. Members of the Memphis Mafia say he was found in bed. Some say he was on a chair. Some say he was on the toilet. Others face down. Uh, I mean, what's going on here, Stephen? This has got to be one of those magical corpses in history. Um, you know, they say they find him face down on the floor, um, which I found out later to be true um, after I spoke with Dan Warlick, who was at the autopsy. Um, and, they, you know, <laughs> he's discovered face down. 
they rush the body to the Baptist Memorial Hospital. Somebody puts a microphone on Joe Esposito, which is his road manager's mouth, and on camera he says he found him dead in bed. Two hours later he said he found him dead on the floor. I don't know why the story keeps changing or why it's necessary for it to keep changing, but it is changing, and it continues to change. It continues to change. His cause of death went from a heart attack to uh, suicide, um, and then he was alive for a while, I guess. And you know, and this is where my book finally comes into the the logical conclusion of what happened. You know, people who are they have to see the whole body of work. They have to understand the undertow and the involvement of the forces behind his career to get the full the full uh, the full gist of what's really going on. Right now. What's strange to me is that when a body is found in this state, liver mortis, to the extent that his, his, his face and his upper body have turned black, blue, purple, that indicates someone who has been dead for a fairly long time. And yet, we're told, when, uh, when the ambulance attendants arrived, they're still trying to, to revive him and perform CPR. What's the point at that point? This is someone who's been dead for hours and hours. Well, you're absolutely right. And, you know, they take the body, and they're going towards um, the other hospital. There's, a, there's another hospital in Memphis, and the name escapes me at the moment. But Baptist Memorial is not the closest hospital. They went to Baptist Memorial because, well, I'll get into that a little bit later on. On the way out of Graceland arrives Dr. Nick. Dr. Nicopoulos jumps into the amb- jumps into the ambulance and is, is just astonished at what he's seeing. How could this be? Elvis just had two complete physicals two weeks beforehand. They'd done cardiograms and treadmills and everything. How could this possibly happen? So they're trying to revive this corpse all the way to Baptist Memorial Hospital, and they get there, and the Harvey team is called, which is the in-house emergency medical team, and they rush this this poor person into um, probably a triage room or a resuscitation room or something. And one of the people who is assisting, according to Lore, said, you know, why are we working on this corpse? And they turned around and said, because it's Elvis Presley. And the, the, the attempts that they tried to revolve by this guy was incredible. I mean, they, they were trying, his, his jaws were clenched shut. They smashed his front teeth out to try and get, um, you know, um, oxygen down his throat. I mean, they were they're just feverishly working on this corpse to the point where, um, while this is going on, of course, the guys in the ambulance are waiting in the waiting room, and they know, they know, they already know, you know, and um, they know he's, he's long gone. And his nurse's page from inside the hospital, Marion Cox, and she shows up, she stops in the waiting room uh, in the, and consoles some of the guys, and she goes in, and, you know, she witnesses, you know, life-saving attempts that are just above and beyond what should be done, and she finally says, you know, look, this boy's long gone. This has got to stop. So that's, according to Laura, how this happened, and right. that I would have to tend to believe. Well, what's interesting is you say when Dr. Uh, Nicopolis got into the back of the ambulance, he's in utter shock because they had just performed, again, Elvis is about to embark on another leg of his tour, never-ending tour. He had just passed a life insurance uh, uh, stress test with flying colors. Yeah, he had to get insured by Lloyds of London, and I think that there was, there were, he did, he, he passed two... Um, full, you know, complete physicals. In- All right, listen, we'll take a time out, Stephen. Stay put. Here's uh, Elvis taking us into the break with Bossa Nova Baby. We'll come back and continue to delve into who murdered Elvis. Steve Ubaney, my guest, right here on Coast to Coast. Welcome back. Say hello on Twitter, at Richard Serrett. Steve Ubaney, my guest, the author of Who Murdered Elvis. He's got a whole uh, sort of line of Who Murdered books. Uh, some have been published, some are upcoming, and you can find them at whomurderedbooks.com, whomurderedbooks.com. One of the, the tragic things that emerges from Who Murdered Elvis is what a lonely life he led, towards the end especially. 
Uh, he couldn't trust anyone, not even members of his own family, or at least the extended family. He was surrounded by backbiters and backstabbers and vampires, really. And, of course, uh, his overbearing um, manager, Colonel Tom Parker. The other thing that emerges that is quite surprising is that Elvis was not some hopeless addict addicted to prescription pills. Stephen Eubaney will disabuse us of that notion as well when we come back. Who murdered Elvis? Right here on Coast to Coast AM. Stay with us. Steve Eubaney, Who Murdered Elvis? On the website whomurderedbooks.com. So Elvis is uh, dead, and there obviously uh, is... uh, you know, tremendous interest in what what killed Tennessee's number one taxpayer. Uh, but there seems to be, uh, certainly based on your research, a a huge rush to judgment on the part of the uh, the medical examiner or the coroner in Shelby County, and that would be Dr. Jerry Francisco. I mean, this, this guy, it sounds like he really wasn't interested in anything but telling people perhaps what they wanted to hear, which was, you know, he died of some heart arrhythmia, which, I mean, explain how ridiculous that really is. You know, before I go into that, I want to tell everybody, uh, I see some people are ordering. I wouldn't order this book off Amazon. Save yourself $5 and go to the website that Richard just mentioned. Amazon doesn't need your $5, believe me. They're doing just fine, okay? So uh, you can get the book cheaper at the website. Yeah, Dr. Um, Dr. Francisco at the time was probably the most qualified person in the state of Tennessee to perform this autopsy. This guy's credentials are incredible, and uh, I just don't know how um, this was. the evidence was ignored to this point. Dr. Um, um, Dan Warlick went to the, um, the death scene with the assistant district attorney and uh, one other person, and they went through Elvis's upstairs, his hidden lair, you know, his fortress of solitude, the place where he called home, and discovered things up there that he thought, you know, bore further investigation. He found two syringes, but in my meeting with Dan, he discussed them as the cartridge type of syringe, almost like a caulking gun, where you would put a tube in, they had no needles, and they were right in plain sight. And of course, he's going through this, this this, these rooms, and he's finding an arsenal of weapons, stuffed teddy bears that people have sent him, all kinds of odd clues. Um, but he also is starting to notice that the scene, the death scene's already been sanitized. The bed's been made. It's not at all how the EMTs left it. So he goes back to his boss, Jerry Francisco, and starts reporting, hey, we've got something going on here. Anytime you sanitize a death scene, there's something worth covering up. People just don't cover things up for no reason. There wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, there wasn't so much as a baby aspirin in this place. There was a, it looked as, the, the EMTs said that there was evidence of a struggle. That was all changed. In other words, in, in, the, in the bathroom where Elvis was found, there were things on the bathroom counter that were kind of strewn, uh, knocked over. That's correct. Yeah, there was evidence of a struggle, and there was a black doctor's bag, a uh, leather bag, and it, it was open. Of course, they're trying not to touch anything, and there's, not, there's nothing in this bag, nothing. So they're, you know, they're, how do you process such things? I mean, these guys are looking at each other like, you know, you know give me a break here, you know? So they go back, and they, Dan Warlick gives all of this evidence to Jerry Francisco, and he says, hey, we're going to have to really investigate this. There's something really strange going on. And he cuts him. He cuts him right off, and says, "How'd you like it on the autopsy?" He had absolutely no interest in it. So one of the things that uh, um, Al Strada, one of the guys who found him, uh, said that was his security guard, wasn't it? His security. I mean, he was. He was. He was actually part of the show. He was part of the road show. So he was packing up to leave. He, okay. he really wasn't a security. So he told the EMTs, "We think he OD'd." Well. That's all they're looking for at this point. So if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So they're looking for these drugs and looking for these drugs and looking for these drugs. So they start the autopsy. They don't even care about anything else. They're, they're 
starting the autopsy, and they completely blow Dan Warlick off. Yeah, well, too bad. We're starting the autopsy. Had had, had Dan Warlick, uh, who you uh, you know got to know quite well, and he just recently passed. Oh yeah, that's a heartbreak. What a, what a tremendous guy. What a great guy. But he also told you that that they found a, a place on the carpet where Elvis had aspirated, and that had been cleaned up. Absolutely true. It was, and this is. Again, this is where, where the rubber meets the road, okay? They're saying that Elvis was on the toilet, and he fell off the toilet, and he was slumped, and this and that, and, you know, it's completely untrue. Uh, it was, <laughs> Elvis was never on the toilet, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the spot on the carpet that they found where he had aspirated, he went down and gave a sniff, and it smelled like cleanser, cleaning fluid, and instead of what it should have smelled like. And this is almost seven feet away from the toilet. Elvis did not fall off the toilet. Again, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. I talked to the man who was there. So right. we have a whole different thing going on here. And I have a first-hand account. Thank God I got the first-hand account. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on here that is not lining up with, uh, with the lore of the situation. And Dan Warlick uh, participated in the autopsy. He held Elvis's heart in his hand. I mean, they dissected this, every square inch of it, right? The first thing that he did, actually, was he dissected Elvis Presley's larynx, his voice box, and took out this organ and looked at this incredibly well-developed organ, you know, that changed the world, actually. And he was looking for signs of swelling, anaphylaxis. He was looking for to see if Elvis died from some drug allergy, because Elvis Presley was allergic to codeine. Everyone knew it, his doctors, his dentists, you know, he almost, he almost died of anaphylactic shock in the 60s taking codeine. Um, so they were looking for that. It's the first thing he did. The second thing he did, he went all over this man's body with a, with a you know, fine-tooth comb here, trying to find any evidence that, you know, there had been an injection in his body, and there was none. He looked everywhere, no injection. So how do these two syringes fit into this equation? Makes absolutely no sense. How the hell did they get there? Makes no sense. But I have an explanation later. So they, they take out his, his organs, and they get to the heart, and this is tough to talk about. And I don't want to know Elvis was murdered. It's just, it's just still tough to talk about, actually. And so I'm, it's tough to get this far in. And they... Dan Warlick and uh, another doctor named Nora Florendo, they take out this heart and they cut it in quarter-inch uh, sections, strips, real thin slices. And they, it was, and Nora Florendo was a doctor who, doctor who was there to work uh, with the electron microscope. So he was taking every single quarter-inch slice of Elvis Presley's heart they were holding out to the light, looking at it under the electron microscope. And... You know, going through this thing, this painstaking organ, quarter inch at a time, looking for a clot, looking for blockage, looking for anything that would, you know, try and give them a clue as to why this man is here. And he did have an oversized heart, according to Dan, his words. He had a big old flabby heart, Dan's words. And I wish he was here to say him himself, but he's not. And there was the ultimate conclusion was this man was years away from heart disease, years away from heart disease. So here we have this autopsy going on. Um, Jerry Francisco had promised the world that they were going to have a result in a couple of hours. So he goes out, they didn't even have test results back, the autopsy's not even done, and he goes out and tells the world that he died from cardiac arrhythmia. Well, in order to diagnose cardiac arrhythmia, you have to listen to a beating heart. You can't diagnose cardiac arrhythmia uh, on a corpse makes absolutely no sense. So he was telling more, a bigger tale than Mother Goose. So, <laughs> and it's really, it's incredible when you stop to think it. Um, in Marilyn Monroe's case, it took, his, it took her uh, coroner 12 days to come back with a cause of death. This guy thinks he's going to do it in a couple hours. The biggest star in the world. It, it just completely defies logic. But meanwhile, there are there are people lined up around in mourning around uh, Graceland, passing out in the mid-August heat, wanting to know an answer. So was, 
Jerry Francisco sort of cognizant of that, knowing that this is Tennessee's favorite son. They don't want to besmirch his 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 legacy by saying that he he died of a drug overdose. Is that what was in Dr. Francisco's mind? I can't speak for the man. I, I have no idea, and I'll I'll just stay there with that. I, I, I'm not going to speak for somebody else. I have no idea what he was thinking, but there was no whatever he said. Um, Dr. Eric Muirhead was actually in charge of uh, of the uh, autopsy, and when Francisco came out and said this fairy tale to the world, Muirhead almost fell over. He was aghast because there was no medical evidence to support what he said. That I can say what he was thinking, I'm sure I have no idea. But you mentioned Marilyn Monroe. Uh, interesting, eerie similarity in that the stomach contents for Marilyn disappeared. Likewise for Elvis, correct? Elvis's stomach contents were washed down the sink at uh, Baptist Memorial Hospital for a reason that I'm sure I have no idea. You can't have a valid autopsy when that happens. And I, it's just it's mystifying, really. Um, there were no photos taken. Uh, usually in uh, the procedure is when you get the corpse and you snap a picture of it for identification purposes. There was only one page filled out on Elvis, Elvis Presley's autopsy report, an autopsy report that nobody's ever seen. That's never been made public. I saw one on the Internet the other day, and it's completely bogus because the real, auto, the real autopsy report is, is locked away. So and, and this is where the, the rubber's meeting the road now. As you point out in, in, in Who Murdered Elvis?, there was not one, not two, but three separate toxicology reports. Walk us through those. Yeah, this completely boggles the mind. Um, it, it's just, it's incredible, really. The first toxicology report, again, they're looking for drugs because all they have is a hammer, so they're looking for that nail, okay? The first toxicology report was done by the University of Tennessee, and it came out, it found the four. Um, types of uh, types of depressants that Elvis had taken that night, but they didn't. They weren't finding. See, there are different levels of uh, of of drugs. There's the trace level. There's the therapeutic level. There's the toxic level and the lethal level. And of course, toxic makes you sick. We all know what lethal is. And the therapeutic is a level that would treat a medical cause. The four drugs they found in Elvis were between trace and therapeutic at the University of Tennessee. So they weren't satisfied with that. They had to go to a nameless, independent lab in Memphis that still hasn't been released. They found basically the same thing. Therapeutic so, levels of uh, sleep aids and, and the type of medications that uh, pre prescribed medications that Elvis was taking under, the, uh, uh, under Dr. Nick. Correct. And they're not happy with that. So what they... What they do is Dr. Harold Sexton takes uh, tissue samples, and um, all actually all of Elvis's organs are still in dry ice somewhere. Um, but anyway, they took tissue samples and they shipped them off to California to bioscience laboratories to do the, you know, to do. They were the highest, the most trained, the more, most high tech. Um, lab in the world at the time and they wanted they put it under an assumed name and it was a rush job and you know they said you know we have to know what's going on here well it's, the cat was pretty much out of the bag at that point i mean here you have a rush job with a you know from from the hospital that elvis just died from so they came back with all kinds of things codeine at 11 times the lethal level and which is shocking because we have a problem if there's yeah. no codeine in the body, if, his, there's, if there's no sign of anaphylaxis, if there's no swelling in that voice box, how the hell does it show up at 11 times the lethal level in one and only one of the three toxicology reports? And if you go that far, you've got a conspiracy, according so, to the legal definition. So, uh, as you pointed out earlier, during the autopsy, uh, Dan Warlick removed Elvis's larynx and looking for uh, some sort of a, an allergic reaction, knowing that Elvis had uh, an allergy to codeine, there was no sign 
uh, of uh, an, an allergic reaction. It would show up in the larynx. larynx. Uh, and yet, the third toxicology report showed 11 times the lethal dose of codeine. So, you know, somebody's zooming somebody here. Well, and then they take this, the, the third, um, this, this erroneous toxicology report, and they give it to my friend, Dr. Cyril Wecht, to, they give him, you know, for his opinion, and they put him on camera, and I say they, it was ABC's 2020 in 1979, and it was Geraldo Rivera and crew, who did a really good job of investigating, by the way. Um, they put Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht, Wecht on camera. Yeah and get his response to this and he said you know how incredible it is that any that this anyone could be taking this level of drugs i talked to, to uh, this doctor afterwards he's a friend of mine he had no idea there were two toxicology re- reports done prior to this so in my opinion my opinion they used his good name to sell us to sell their story because that was the one they chose to blast to the world which creates the myth of, you know, Elvis died of a cocktail of drug overdose. Elvis wasn't taking all the drugs that were prescribed to him. And this is what people don't understand. In 1976, Elvis was having financial problems, and his father had taken over his finances and let a couple of employees go, did some drastic measures, was in the middle of selling a plane. We'll come back to that because that's important. And he... uh, (laughs) He, well, this is important as in, in terms of, of you were alluding to the fact that Elvis wasn't taking all the drugs that were prescribed by Dr. Nick. Well, yeah, well what uh, was happening is Elvis didn't want to get an earful from his father for buying drugs for all of the Memphis Mafia. So Dr. Nicopolis, being one of Elvis's good buddies and his doctor, was writing them all in Elvis's name. But, but he wasn't like a, taking them. The Memphis Elvis. Mafia were taking them. They were a candy bowl in the middle of the room, and if there was one or two left, maybe they'd give them to Elvis, but everyone was taking them. So here we have ABC and Geraldo Rivera saying Elvis is taking these huge amounts of drugs and this and that and the other thing, and he wasn't. Nobody could. There's no way. It would have been impossible. <laughs> I mean, it was like 4,500 pills that were prescribed to him, but he was doing that just to escape you know, getting an earful from his father. So, El- so just to be clear, Elvis, as has long been reported, this was this hopeless addict addicted to uh, prescribed drugs, and and Doctor Nick was, uh, n- you know, negligent and derelict in his duty, and was pres- over prescribing Elvis uh, sleeping aids and so forth. And you're saying that is not the case? No, it's not the case at all. Elvis Presley was a veteran pill popper, and he was so worried after he had anaphylaxis shock, anaphylactic shock with codeine um, years and years prior. He was so worried about that happening, he asked Dr. Nick for the physician's reference. He knew what every pill looked like. He knew what he could take with what. I mean, this is, this is a very smart man. This was no dummy. Elvis Presley was a very smart man. And he was very schooled. And one of the guys in one of the books, one of his bodyguards, said, you show him a pill, he'll tell you what it is. Um, how to take it, when to take it, what to take it with, everything. So this is there's no way that uh, you know, this guy is making mistakes like this. You know, it's um, it just it's impossible. No way he could have mis- mistaken a codeine for something else. Uh, well, that no codeine in the body, right? That's how true. Mistake it for it. That's true. You know, this is again. This is where the rubber rubber meets the road. And if there's right. codeine in the body, you know. If there's no coating in the body, how the hell does it show up at, at this gigantic amount of, you know, uh, it, in the toxicology report, it doesn't wash. It doesn't wash, indeed. Stephen, stay put. We'll come back and continue to pour over the evidence. Who murdered Elvis? Steve Eubaney. Steve Eubaney stays with us. Who murdered Elvis? And the website is whomurderedbooks.com. Whomurderedbooks.com. Yeah, your, uh, your good friend, the late Dr. Dan Warlick, who... Uh, arrived at Graceland shortly after uh, Elvis's death uh, to investigate and was uh, allowed up into that inner sanctum upstairs where nobody gets to go. Not 
not ex-presidents, no one gets to go upstairs at, at Graceland, which of course is also fueled, uh, you know, the legend that he's uh, still alive and that's where he lives. Uh, but you you mentioned off the top that when he came back uh, to Graceland, something that that uh, Vernon said to him uh, kind of shook him to his core. What did he say? <laughs> this is this is what speaks to what I said earlier about other people on the inside knowing that Elvis was murdered, and, and it's nobody's talking about it. Vernon Presley, Elvis Presley's father knew immediately that he was murdered. He said, oh, my God, they've murdered my son. And Vernon was, and if you go on my website, you can see Dr. Nicopolis. There's a video clip there under the Who Murdered Elvis page. You can hear Dr. Nicopolis on the video say Elvis was murdered. Go to my website, check it out. You won't believe it. It's the best kept secret in the world. Vernon Presley um, was so sure that uh, Elvis Presley was murdered. He hired two private investigators to investigate his son's death. Unfortunately, he died in 1979, two years after Elvis did, and they weren't allowed. They never got a chance to complete their work. My book is the only book that ever completed Elvis Presley's probe into his son's death. So, very interesting stuff. Um, Dick Grubb, um, Elvis Presley's chief of security, has a book out. I believe it's entitled "It's entitled The Elvis Conspiracy." I've not met Dick Grubb. But it's a good book. He said the, from day one he was murdered. Elvis's co-star, I'm not sure if it was Blue Hawaii, uh, but 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 to she had this uh, actress had had uh, starred in several films with Elvis, and she maintained a, a a tight bond with him, and she was also very very convinced that Elvis was murdered. Tell me about what happened to her. Well, her name was Susanna Lee, and she was his co-star in Paradise Hawaiian Style. And I lost her just about the same time I lost Dan. These people are reaching the end of their years now. Uh, fortunately, I had many chats with Susanna, who knew immediately that Elvis Presley had been murdered. And she made the mistake of going public with it, public with it in 1978. And what they did to this woman is positively incredible. They sabotaged her car, they shot at her, they burned her house down. Um, there was an armed intruder who jumped in and jumped over her, her condo wall and killed all of her, her dogs. He had five or six dogs. And they, they went after her with such vigor, she actually had to leave the state of Tennessee. So, you know, this doesn't happen if Elvis is out there alive. You know, there's, there's something going on here. So... And there's a quote by um, Ginger Alden um, in the book um, The Death of Elvis, where they were talking about Elvis's father was going around questioning everyone. One person in particular inside the Memphis Mafia, he questioned about uh, murdering Elvis, and I'm not going to mention that name. But Ginger said he was talking about foul play, and I couldn't rule it out. Hmm. So, you know, there's... This, it's not just me on an island over here waving, saying, oh, by the way, this has been talked about for 40 years, and it, it just it's not going anywhere. And the murderer is still out there. They got into Graceland with help. And it, it's just incredible to me, actually. But again, we're dealing with that normalcy bias. Now, I, I want to just sort of take a bit of a side road here, but it, it, it does lead back to it, obviously, and that is Elvis's involvement with the FBI. We have, of course, uh, that, that famous summit with President Richard Nixon in the Oval Office in, was it 1971, 72? Uh, Elvis collected badges. He wanted a, 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 an FD, uh, a, um, a drug enforcement uh, badge more than anything. Uh, but tell me about how that meeting went down and what happened. Well, Elvis met Nixon on December 21st of 1970, and he was, you know, one of his hobbies was collecting state and federal, um, state and um, local badges. And he was a deputy, I think, God, every, everywhere he went, um, they gave him a badge and this and that. It was just one of the things that he, Colonel Parker, allowed him to do. It was harmless enough. Well, he had a problem. He was getting death threats. Serious stuff, and if you go through his FBI file, you can clearly see that the man's life was in danger. There are bars on Graceland for a reason, folks. They're gone now, but they were there for a reason. So he wanted to carry guns legally in every state. In order to do that, you need a federal credential. He also didn't like the uh, 
were the the turn that uh, the country was taking. You know, after the radical sixties, you know, the country was was falling apart in his eyes, and he wanted to help. So, on a plane, he he sketched out a, a letter to Richard Nixon, and uh, he was he was sitting next to a politician actually, and the politician uh, encouraged him to write this letter. A couple of days later, um, he ends up meeting Richard Nixon, and uh, you know this is this has been joked about and joked about. This is no joke. Elvis Presley was a federal narcotics agent, okay, and what they wanted him to do is they wanted to investigate the mob in Las Vegas, and Elvis, through his performing career, played there two months a year at the International Hotel, which later became the Las Vegas Hilton. And what they requested him to do after he got the badge was hide FBI agents and pose them as band members to provide cover for them so they can investigate the mob. So now we're starting to get into why he may have been murdered. You can see where this is going. Sure. I mean, he, so he has FBI agents in his embedded in his band as they're performing in Las Vegas. Uh, what does Colonel Tom Parker think about all of this? It's furious. Absolutely furious. Why? <laughs> well, before I get to that, let's earmark that. I have to say a couple of other things here. That was supposed to be confidential. And Elvis's letter to Nixon, he said, I, I am help, happy to help the country out. He's a huge patriot. I'm happy to help the country out as long as it stays private. Well, somebody to the Washington Post on January 27, 1972, leaked it. So now here it is, nationwide, Elvis Presley has this badge. Completely blew his cover, which he was furious about, absolutely furious. So, um, and I can't, and how we know this, I can't take credit for this. Like I said, there were 30 years of, of evidence there before I got there. In 1990, uh, Elvis researcher Maria Columbus went to the wall in the trophy room in Graceland and found a letter on the wall that the federal government was thanking Elvis for his participation in something. So she investigated and wanted to know what it was all about. They mailed her a letter back. They're the one that told her what happened. So this is how we know. It took decades for this to come out, but this is how we know all of this. So Colonel Tom Parker is furious because he has a nice little cozy relationship with organized crime in Las Vegas. So here we have, um, how far do you want me to go on Colonel Parker? Should I bring everybody right up this enough as to where this guy? Let's do it. I mean, yeah, I mean, he, it, Colonel Tom has a huge gambling problem, and so he's kind of up to his keister with the mob, right? Well, Colonel Tom Parker, he was, his name wasn't Tom Parker and he wasn't a colonel. He was born in the Netherlands. His real name is Adrius Van Koo, and he worked his way up through carnivals, being a showman, and he was working on the docks, trying to earn enough money to get to America. Well, on May 27th of 1929, he murdered a woman and stowed on a ship to come to America. Okay. Um, and again, this is in Elena Nash's book, The Colonel. This is all laid out. I'm giving everyone the, the quick tour of this great book, by the book, by the way. Um, so he still weighs in a ship, comes to America, goes into the Army, goes AWOL, and comes back in solitary confinement, and he emerges with a mental illness to the point where they give him a discharge. So he's a mental patient, and what he does is to escape prosecution, he assumes the, the name and the rank of his commanding officer, Colonel Tom Parker. So he's under an assumed name, and he works his way up to manage Minnie Pearl, Hank Snow, Gene Austin, Roy Acuff, June Carter Cash, of course, is Johnny Cash's future wife, and Eddie Arnold. And he had quite a relationship managing Eddie Arnold. Arnold those two parted badly. <laughs> And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, matter of fact, Eddie Arnold warned Vernon and Elvis, stay away from him. And, of course, and their poverty had them ignoring him. But because he represented all of these people, they f he found himself in Las Vegas dealing with the big players of the day. Uh, Milton Prell, 
um, who was probably first on the scene in 1947, opened the Bingo Club in Las Vegas, which later became the Sahara. He went on to uh, buy the Aladdin and then the Mint downtown. He was um, part of the Detroit Syndicate, and they were placing their bookie and race wire money out there as, as a cover to make more money. Next, on the, and he became fast friends with, um, with Milton Pro, Colonel Parker. The next one is Modell. It's in the 50s and 60s. There was no one bigger in Las Vegas. He was part of the Cleveland Syndicate, and they, you know, they follow, followed suit with Mer- Milton Prell, of course, because they all cooperated with each other. And he bought the Stardust and the Desert Inn. Mo Dallas's per- real reason for being uh, out there was being a close to be a close ally to Meyer Lansky and Jeremy Hoffa, and of course Mo Dallas is the one that made Frank Sinatra who he is, and Mo Dallas also participated with Colonel Tom Parker to make Elvis who he was. You don't play in Vegas casinos without these people, especially then. So talk about biting the biting the hand that feeds you. Elvis uh, is the patriot spying on the mob at the behest of the FBI. Meanwhile, the reason he's performing in Las Vegas is because of Colonel Tom Parker's association with the mob. And there's about to be a head-on collision. And this is what got him murdered. So, Parker became such good friends with Milton Prell that they, and Mo Dallas, that they all were neighbors in Palm Springs. So... (laughs) As soon as they start to be good, cozy buddies, all of a sudden, Colonel Tom Parker's medical rec- um, uh, military records disappear in a fire. The facility goes up in flames in, in St. Louis. How convenient. So, as I said... Is this, I give, sorry, just a, a, quick, a, quick, just a quick sidebar. Is this why Elvis never performed... Out, he never did, you know, the worldwide tour. He never performed outside of North America because of Colonel Tom Parker's obvious visa problems? He can't get out of the country. So when Elvis goes, gets drafted into the Army, which was a favor that the mob did for them to get a deferment until a picture was finished, Parker can't go anywhere. Elvis is getting offers to perform in front of the pyramids at Giza. Elvis is going crazy. He wants to do this. They have to turn it down and turn it down. Colonel Parker can't go. So, you know, we have a problem with Colonel Parker. So as soon as Colonel Parker starts getting to be friends with, and cozy friends with the mob, he decides the time is right to pay them tribute, like they did in the old country, to the mob. And he went from a 25% cut of Presley's um, cash to a 50-50 cut, with the other 25% going to the mob for tribute. This is how he kept getting booked and booked and booked in Vegas so easily. This is why he was getting worldwide press, because back then things were different. You know, um, it was a little different. Even Elvis's wedding, it was all mob planned. It was Frank Sinatra's plane. <laughs> you know, it was at the Aladdin Hotel, Milton Prell's uh, uh, hotel. I mean, it's incredible. If you go, if you get my book, there are pictures of Elvis Presley posing with both of these mobsters. And it's, it's incredible. Uh, Mo Dallas act- actually funded some of Elvis Presley's movies. I mean, they, they just couldn't be more cozy. So here's Elvis Presley biting the hand that feeds him. And, of course, they're all undercover in Las Vegas trying to uh, investigate the mob. Well, if we know anything about the Las Vegas mob back then, and of course, things are different today. They had all of the, all of the rooms bugged. They, they all got caught. And Elvis Presley died mysteriously just before he was supposed to turn state's evidence against the mob. And we, we, we'll talk about that, the Operation Fountain Pen, in, in the, uh, the next half hour, and we will open up the phone lines at the top of the next hour with Steve Ubaini, author of Who Murdered Elvis? Who Murdered Books.com is uh, where to get it. Uh, but wh- the other thing that I was taken by in your book is, I mean, I think we all had a sense of how controlling Colonel Tom was, but not to the extent that, uh, as you point out, I mean, he controlled Every single aspect of Elvis's life, who his friends could be, what books he could read. It was incredible. Elvis Presley was in a velvet jail. It was uh, my friend called it golden handcuffs. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, he was completely under the authoritative thumb of this mental patient who 
had one of the, you know, we all have our little idiosyncrasies. He was probably one of the most degenerate gamblers that ever walked the earth. And at the time Elvis Presley died, he owed $32 million in gambling debts to the mob in their casinos. So getting back to, uh, <laughs> getting back to, um, to what you were saying, um, he controlled everything because Elvis was his meal ticket for the gambling habit. So he didn't want any, anything getting into Elvis or getting out from Elvis, Elvis that could ruin his meal ticket. So he controlled the books that he could read. He actually threw friends out of his life. Uh, the 1968 comeback special was done by a man named Steve Bender. And, of course, it was El uh, Colonel Parker had a totally different thing in mind. He wanted Elvis singing Christmas songs like probably Perry Cuomo. And, of course, it was a black leather-clad reunion because of Steve Bender. After that split, the two men exchanged phone numbers. Colonel Parker intercepted every single number, and it would never let those two ever talk. It wasn't... It wasn't until decades later that Steve Bender, um, who it would have been perfect for Elvis, they got along better, and he understood the, the musical trends better of the day. Um, it would have been. It wasn't until decades later that Steve Bender came to realize what had actually happened. Same thing with *The Star Is Born*. Elvis Presley was offered uh, instead of Chris Christopherson, he was offered the role uh, in *The Star Is Born*. But Colonel Parker jacked the price up so high it would have been impossible for them to do it because he wanted Elvis to be a one trick pony that he could control the tricks. And he had, because he had his gambling debts, I mean, I, I was shocked to learn that Elvis at the time of his death, I mean, I think he was one of the first stars to, 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 to earn about a billion dollars in revenue from everything, movies and so forth. But he was only worth only what $10 million at the time of his death. He should have been worth a hundred times that. Absolutely. He was actually, he, he actually, because the Recording Industry Artists of America didn't really start registering, registering all the record sales when Elvis came out. So he was probably sold more records than they say, and he was probably worth more money than they project because of it. You know, we have to realize the time here. Elvis comes out in 55, and he comes of age with television, portable record players. Uh, for the first time, kids finally have their own music. You know, they're not sitting around listening to, you know, don't send her to the apple tree with their parents. So, I mean, Elvis broke, he pierced the veil for everyone. So he was, he was incredibly important in history. And he, he made a lot of money because of it. But because it was so new, um, you know, not all of his money was was tracked through the recording industry artists of America because of the, the sales. So, but also, I mean, the colonel was running him into the ground because he had to pay off the colonel's gambling debts, unbeknownst to Elvis, perhaps. But I mean, he literally worked him to death. We'll discuss that on the other side. Steve Ubaney, who murdered Elvis? Who murdered Books dot com? Say, if you like what you're hearing tonight this morning, you might wish to check out my weekly syndicated radio program, The Conspiracy Show. It airs live Sunday nights, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern, and uh, in delay on about 40 affiliates across North America. For more information and a list of affiliates, visit my website, strangeplanet.ca, or you can download the free Conspiracy Show app and listen anywhere in the world. And also, I invite you to check out my podcast, Conspiracy Unlimited. New episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can subscribe at conspiracyunlimitedpodcast.com. My other podcast, The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, part of the Jericho Network. And this uh, week's episode was uh, part two of my two-part interview with Alan Parsons of the Alan Parsons Project. The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, available on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Back with more of my conversation with Steve Ubaney, who murdered Elvis, right here on Coast to Coast AM. Steve, share with me uh, and us, uh, if you could, a quick story about the extent to which Colonel Tom Parker drove Elvis uh, almost to the grave, the way he worked him. There's a, a, a terrible story of uh, Elvis being so tired, he was practically unconscious. Well, it was almost um, entertainer servitude. It got to the point where nothing mattered to Colonel Parker except that paycheck. 
he probably was, like I said, he was probably one of the most degenerate gamblers um, anybody's ever seen. You know, at a time when most people were making $5,800 a week back in 1969, I'm sorry, $5,800 a year in 1969, he was gambling a million and a half a day by one account. And that came in from a uh, quote from Larry Geller. So he had to come, he had to always push Elvis and push him and push him and push him. And <laughs> it was, you know, even in Vegas, I mean, he'd be there for two months and he'd work two shows a night, sometimes three, seven days a week in an hour and 25 minutes a show. And he was the whole show. It's not like you're a bass player in a band like Aerosmith or something or, or a drummer where if you have an off night, everybody else can carry you. So he had such a high, sh- a high energy show that he was so tired by the time he got off the stage, he was c- about cross-eyed. And Colonel Parker's just said, as long as we keep doing dates, everything will be fine. Well, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it started to end badly. Elvis started to be in poor health. In one time in particular, he was uh, in a date. Uh, just before he had a, he had a date, he had to um, perform a date. Um, it, and it escapes me. I think, it was, I think it was St. Louis. I think it was St. Louis. No, I'm sorry, it was Louisville. It was Louisville, and it was, it was 1976, and Elvis is in bed, almost comatose, and he's moaning. And Dr. Nick is trying to revive him, and he's, he's dunking his head in ice water to try and, to try and uh, you know, revive him. And this is a, a quote. I'm paraphrasing something that Larry Geller, one of Elvis's uh, really good friends, had, had said in, one, in a video. Um, he said that you know, Parker comes in, and Larry Geller gets up, and he says, you know, they meet face to face, and you know Larry Geller's thinking, "Well, this is great. He's going to see what what is going on here, and he can't let this go on. It's inhuman." So he walks in, the door closes. He's in in the bedroom talking to Doctor Nicopolis for a couple of minutes. He comes out and he tells Larry Geller, "The only thing that matters is that that man is on stage t- tonight. That's the only thing that matters." Turns around, walks out. So this is what you have on your hands. And did Elvis perform that night? He did. He did. Even his last concert, his voice never failed him. I mean, you look at a guy, and, you know, look at it. It's easy to look at Elvis in the condition he was in at his last concert. You're looking at a very sick man. And Elvis had a birth defect. He had a twisted colon. So... You know, here's this guy who couldn't, this is one of the reasons he wasn't on the toilet. He hadn't had a bowel movement in weeks, which is why he was so loaded up. And they discovered that at the autopsy. So we're starting to get into the cover-up, which, should we go to the cover-up yet? Or do you we, want me to well, continue on? I, 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 I want to just touch on one more thing before that, and that is um, we were talking about his work with the FBI uh, I, I want to talk about Operation Fountain Pen. What was that all about? Well, as I said before, in 76, Elvis was the biggest taxpayer in Tennessee. And he was, Elvis Presley almost filed bankruptcy that year. He was really in, uh, he was really in a bad financial way. So his father had seized his, his father had seized his uh, finances trying to make him solvent. And he had a plane. Elvis wanted a bigger and better plane. You know, that's just kind of the way it is. You know, I mean, Elvis, you know, he was a bigger and better sort of guy. You know, he couldn't have one ring. He had to have five. He was Elvis Presley. So good for him. So I wish I could do that. Um, so he had this, uh, uh, it was called Hound Dog 2. He named it Hound Dog 2. It was a jet star. And it, was, it was one of his first planes. And they were selling it in 1976. So, um, he still owed, I think, you know, nine hundred thousand dollars on it or something, some astronomical amount of money. And his father had this thing for sale. He got contacted by a man named Frederick Pro, and Frederick Pro said, "Look, I'll buy the plane for what you want." He said, "But you're going to have to remortgage it." He said, "Here's a way where you can make more than what the plane's worth." He said, "Remortgage the plane." Plus, borrow more for the for the um, the necessary um, renovations to it because it's a little outdated now. And he said, "I'll take the plane, and then I'll just give you checks." Well, 
here's poor here's poor Vernon Presley who just got out shystered. Um, they took he went in hock for double what the plane was worth. The guy took the plane. The checks never came. So now he has the plane. The Presleys have no money. So here comes the FBI investigation. So um, the FBI, Elvis, of course, he's good friends with the FBI, so he gets the FBI involved to get these people. Come to find out, this is an international mob ring that has been doing things like this around the globe for better than five years. They've been watching this guy. So this is, you know, here we are with Elvis with their with the FBI ears in Vegas. They're trying to find out if this person, this Frederick Pro, is tied into the people in Vegas, which was which was the other side of the investigation. So all of this is going on um, in the weeks preceding Elvis Presley's um, odd, very odd demise. So, so Vernon and Elvis are asked by the FBI to take part in this sting operation to nab these guys, correct? Absolutely. So, like I said, Elvis Presley died mysteriously days before he was going to turn state's evidence um, in this airplane sting. So he had, <laughs> it's just incredible, you know, by, by 77, he had managed to piss off the mob his manager, the federal government, um, he was writing people out of his will. Um, he was firing people or letting them go. Um, he, he was breaking up with his girlfriend. I mean, it, it, and, you know, you get to the point where there were more people that wanted this guy dead than alive. He had managed to piss off almost everybody. It was incredible, really. Right. So you have all of this beehive of angst around this guy who mysteriously ends up dead. Uh, the, the the people in Graceland, uh, the extended family, that were basically just sort of backbiters, backstabbers, and leeches living off of his avails. Uh, well, Vernon was trying to cut them out because, again, he was trying to get Elvis's finances in order. And so there were some people that were let go inside the Memphis Mafia uh, that now all of a sudden, you know, they have kind of a, they've got a motive here. There's a lot of motive. Elvis Presley's father was divorcing his wife, Dee Stanley. Um, and his, uh, his boys were, of course, raised with, with Elf, Elvis. And now we have to change the will because Elvis has to write people out of his will. And he wrote a lot of people out of his will. At the time Elvis Presley died, there were two wills. So I hope we have time to get into the cover-up because yes. it's, it's big. Yes, we will. So... Uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, three of his toughest bodyguards, Red West, Sonny West, and Dave Hebler, um, two of the three died last year as well. It's a shame we're losing these people. Um, they were let go by Vernon, not Elvis, and, well, there are multiple reasons why they were let go. But they swore vengeance, and they started this bodyguard book, which was this tell-all Elvis what happened talking about the back stories of uh, all the things that Elvis allegedly did. It was kind of a childish book. It was a revenge book. So we have that going on. They're out to smear his name. And Colonel Parker gets frustrated with Elvis. Elvis is becoming a liability. He's canceling tours. He's not drawing like he used to. He's starting to have some health issues. So the colonel tries to sell his contract. It gets picked up by a paper in Nashville. So here comes the bodyguard book on the heels of, Elvis, of uh, Colonel Parker trying to sell his contract. When, of course, no one's going to buy the contract now, now that all of these lurid things are out in the public. So, you know, in a roundabout way, you know, that didn't do Elvis uh, any favors. In, in his 1976 turned into 77, Colonel Parker couldn't pay off his gambling debts. And he started to fear for his life. You're not going to owe the mob $32 million. I got news for you. Right, right. But, 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 but Colonel Tom had also positioned himself where he had figured out a way where he didn't need a living Elvis to continue to make money. In 1974, Colonel Parker started Boxcar Enterprises, which was kind of the precursor to what Elvis Presley Enterprises is. Um, and it was above board thing just like Elvis Presley Enterprises is. Only Elvis Presley Enterprises is better at it, much better. Um, 
he could sell, and Elvis got a little chunk of this, of course, just like all the deals, the business deals, it was grossly unfair to Elvis. And he, he being Colonel Parker, could sell his image, you know, posters and decanters or what have you. And selling his image, there's more money in it, money in Images don't can- cancel tours. Images don't get sick. So he had managed to slightly remove himself from the living, breathing Elvis. I mean, that sounds like a, no, a no-brainer today, but, but this is 45 years ago. This so was kind of a novel, this was novel marketing back then. Oh, yeah. And Colonel Parker was a genius. I mean, he was an absolute genius. He was an evil genius, but he was a genius nonetheless. So... All of a sudden, as is, as is so often the case, we see this. This is a common denominator in so many cases. All of a sudden, the star is worth more dead than alive. Literally, the mot- absolutely um, the motives are around this guy for for people to murder him. And of course, in my book, I lay out the motive, means, and opportunity of all the suspects. And I do that with all of my books. Just like just like they would do if it was uh, <laughs> it's a good thing I did because in forty years nobody else has, which is incredible to me. When you learn the other side of the story, um, uh, Doctor Nicopolis, Elvis led him two hundred seventy five thousand dollars to do a, an office building downtown. He was going to rent. That turned out to be a financial disaster. That caused hard feelings. Um, Joe Esposito wanted to do. Um, um, racquetball courts around the country with Elvis's name. Elvis didn't have a problem with it. Colonel Parker wasn't getting his cut, blew his stack over it. So there were bad feelings there. Um, it was, it's just on and on and on. 1976, and here we start getting into the cover-up, okay? 1976, um, Elvis, who's always had a fascination with the Kennedy assassination, um, starts to learn about the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And he got in touch with William Sullivan, who was um, J. Edgar Hoover's second in command, who eventually went on because Hoover died long before this. He had been talking to him about financing um, an investigation into what really happened. So the same people who murdered Elvis murdered JFK. And the parallels are incredible if we start getting into this 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 cover up um, well we have a, a, about 4 minutes to the top of the hour let's just start just the the alt, i know you know this is a who done it this book and you don't want you want people to to enjoy reading it uh so you don't want to give everything away here but give us i mean if the 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 uh, official timeline didn't go down that way how did it happen again elvis is you know, final moments. What likely happened? <laughs> well, like I said, they got into Graceland with help. Um, it was a professional assassin, and they got up behind him, and they smashed his face into the ground, which, you know, did his nose in, which is why the conspiracy people who say there was a wax dummy in the casket had a pug nose instead of the other nose. And, well, I'm not going to give away how the murder happened, but um, you know, the cover-up was incredible. Um, all of the notes from Dan Warlick's visit to Graceland, his car was burglarized that night, and the only thing that were stolen was his photograph and notes of Graceland. The cover-up is incredible, even with the parallels in the Kennedy assassination. Um, JFK's pristine bullet to spin people around and, and, and get them going crazy, just like Elvis's empty syringes that were planted by the assassin. It was to spin people all around the other way. The single bullet theory set up Oswald as a patsy. The drug theory in the toxicology report set up Dr. Nick. There were two death certificates filed that it contradicted each other. Um, it's, it's incredible. And the pants down around the ankles, typical mob thing. This is what they do to tough guys. Um, Sonny Liston, same thing. He defied the mob and beat Chuck Wepner when he was supposed to lose. Uh, they found him in the exact same um, manner that they found Elvis Presley. Pants down around the ankles, um, sanitized death scene, um, you know, <laughs> same thing with Marilyn Monroe. You know, there's a trend here. 
the sanitized death scene, JFK. Here we go. He's in there in the in the in the ER. You have Secret Service members cleaning the the blood splatters. You got a crime scene, and they're cleaning up the blood splatter. And right. It's just on and on and on. The, so that the, uh, the 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 pajamas around the ankles that is is a is a I think you mentioned a Sicilian mafia sig, uh, symbol. You know to degrade the victim. Uh, and this is, you know, to show this is what happens. I mean, this is kind of a, a classic mafioso M.O., right? Oh, yeah. They did it to Benito Mussolini. They did it to Benito this is, This is their, the, the final humiliation to tough guys. You want to play with us? Fine. This is what we'll do. And so... Obviously, uh, they had to have help from inside Graceland, but if there were so many people who were living in Graceland who were upset with Elvis, they would have had some willing uh, uh, co-conspirators, I'm guessing. True, but they knew exactly when to do this because Elvis was starting his next tour the next day, and a good majority of the people were on site in Portland, in Portland, Maine, where he was supposed to start his tour. So Graceland was kind of an empty hall when this happened. Like I said, professional assassins aren't stupid. They know. They get blueprints. They know everything. So, you know, they came in at the right time. And the timelines of the death don't line up. I talked to a fellow named uh, Paul Lichter, who was one of Elvis's friends, um, who has uh, Elvis's unique um, record club. Really nice guy. He sent Elvis a registered letter that Elvis signed for at 930. It's in my book. You can see it. He still has it. I want to buy it from him, actually. Elvis came down to the front door. He answered the front door and signed for a registered letter. Right. At a time when he was supposed to be dead. Fascinating. Is that when the uh, assassin came in? Perhaps. I'm not going to give the book away. I think I'm going to... All right. Her. Okay. Say no more. Otherwise, we'll both have to hire someone to, to start our car in the morning. Uh, Steve, we will uh, open up the phones and uh, take questions and comments. And uh, are you good for that? Uh, sure. All right. Well, uh, don't worry. They'll behave. Uh, Steve Ubaney, who murdered Elvis? And we are back with Steve Ubaney, who murdered Elvis, who murdered books dot com. Uh, Dan Warlick, before he passed, I mean, what was his opinion? He he was uh, investigating uh, the death scene and, and took part in the autopsy. Did he come to believe also that Elvis was murdered, Stephen? You know, he had no idea what evidence existed outside of the autopsy table. So in my last conversation with Dan Warlick, um, yes, he, he, he started, it had never been presented to him before. He's a man of science. This is what he does. He was, he was an attorney in Nashville with a very special practice, and, you know, he's a man of science. So he had no idea outside of the autopsy table what existed out there that would suggest this. So the, uh, the short answer is yes. The long answer is a little more complicated. Um, but yeah, he was uh, he was shocked actually and, when he read. And what about your your other colleague, the great Cyril Wecht? What does he think? Doctor Wecht is, you know, that's a good question. I haven't talked to Cyril in some time. Um, he was he loved the book. He was intrigued by the book. He said, "Give me something other than the paper they gave me." And I said, "Cyril, I would absolutely love to do that. I can't do that. I mean, there's there's really." You know, nobody's going to exhume Elvis Presley. I mean, come on. You know, so, I mean, it's not like we have tissue samples kicking around. Well, I know one doctor. Well, maybe they, maybe they still have tissue samples still around. But um, I have I ha can give nothing to Dr. Wecht, another man of science, to, you know, compel him to change anything. Dr. Wecht was put in a very bad situation. You know, he... They stuck a camera in his face as he read someone else's conclusion. He didn't test anything. And boy, I tell you what, if he was at the autopsy, he would have had accurate results in a flash. But unfortunately, here we are 40 years past, and he wasn't there. Now, Vernon had uh, ordered a specific casket for his son. Wasn't it intended that he, he, would, he had hoped that at, at some point Elvis could be exhumed so that they would find... Uh, the actual cause of death? Elvis's father 
because of everything that was going on, he was a, a pinnacle part of, of course, the FBI investigation and the plane and everything. He knew Elvis was murdered. He knew it. He knew immediately. So because of that, he and the mortician, and the man's name escapes me at the moment. I'm sorry. It's uh, 4 o'clock in the morning here. He's just standard. I'm sorry. I can't remember the mortician's name. But they both knew that this was a very suspicious death. So the casket looked the same as his mother's, identical. It had special cylinders in there to preserve certain things. Uh, so if it was ever to be exhumed, you know, there, was, there would be something there. What was in those cylinders, I have no idea. I know it was a special casket for that special purpose. That's beyond that, I don't know. Like I said, I ha- you know, I'm, <laughs> I've been called an Elvis expert. I hate that word, expert. There's some things I just don't know. <laughs> I'll do my best, but there's some things I don't know, and that's one of them. All right, let's go west of the Rockies. Linda is in Auburn, Washington. Linda, good morning. Welcome to Coast to Coast. Good morning, Richard. I'm glad you took my call. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Yes, and as disturbing as this is, it's it's so typical of the uh, deceit, the web of deceit we are trapped in. But I wanted to ask Steve, the guest, about Ginger. I mean, she was right in that room with all that commotion going on, the struggle, and and the assassin. She must have known something. Why hasn't she come forth? And is she still living? And, you know, she must know in her heart what really happened. Great question, Linda. Ginger Alden was supposedly in bed next to Elvis, when he said, uh, I'll be right back, I'm just going to the bathroom, why yes. didn't she hear the commotion? Yes. Well, Linda, thanks for your question. Yes. Um, uh, Ginger Alden is still alive, and she is doing well, and she went on to have a very successful career as an actress. Um, I have never met her. I can't speak for her as to what she knows or what she may not know. What she told the authorities is she was sleeping so soundly, you know, she uh, she was unaware that anything was going on. I have said in my book that I believe that she was elsewhere. When Dick Robb came in, um, Elvis's chief of security, he said that she was quite dolled up when the, the uh, everything went down, when the people came to get the body and this and that and the other thing. He thinks that um, there's more to that story. I won't go into it on the air, but uh, you know there are a couple of accounts that she was not exactly there the whole the whole night. So she may have stepped out and come back. Her account is that she was uh, she was sleeping very soundly. I have to take her at her word. Okay, Linda, thank you for that. Someone also called the National Enquirer while Elvis was lying there on the carpet. Did did they not? That's correct, and that is another thing that uh, Dick Grob had mentioned. Um, he said that, um, of course, they're monitoring the phone calls. You know, Graceland's a fortress. It's not Graceland. It's, you know, it's got, you know, armed guards, 24-hour security, closed, closed uh, cameras, you know, closed-circuit TVs. This is likened to um, Michael Corleone's fortress in The Godfather, Godfather Two. I mean, you have a wall, you have security, you have everything. So uh, <laughs> it's um, it's incredible when all the phone calls and everything are monitored. Someone called from Graceland, the National Enquirer, the man named James, James Kirk. Not Captain Kirk, although same name. Um, he was um, the contact of the National Enquirer in uh, in Memphis at the time, called him and said, you know, I've got a story, bring cash. There's going to be something going on at Graceland. According to them, their words, not mine, um, they believe it was Ginger. This is what has been repeated throughout. Um, 
I wasn't there. I have no idea. It's secondhand information, which I hate. I don't like secondhand information. I try and get as much source direct information as I can. But this is what they claim. Now, what about the rumors that Elvis was going to remarry Priscilla, that he had no intention of marrying Ginger Alden, although she claimed she had an engagement ring from him? Well, that's the first I've heard of him trying to remarry Priscilla. That's a, for, that's a new one on me. Um, as far as the, um, the engagement, um, I've heard multiple things about that. Um, some quite fantastic and some a little unbelievable. Uh, I'm not going to go into flights of fancy because I'm not. I know what Susanna Lee has told me from inside. Of course, she was friends with all of them. But you have to understand, Susanna Lee was not exactly the president of Priscilla Presley's fan club. So I'm not going to repeat what was told to me. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a big conspiracy guy. I know that sounds terrible. You know, because of this big conspiracy going on, so I don't want to. I don't want to put my nose in that trough. As far as the, um, as far as the engagement, my opinion of it: if Elvis was going to marry a woman, it would have been the biggest and most ornate diamond in the state of Tennessee. I don't believe he would have recycled a diamond out of one of his rings, which is what was claimed. That doesn't make sense to me. I do know that there was another woman uh, involved in the picture. Her name was Alicia Corwin, and she, they had started seeing each other, and, and Ginger was aware of this. And all of a sudden, you know, when she was there, the phone would ring off the wall. We got this from someone close to the situation. And, you know, Elvis started to confide into this other woman, and... She mysteriously ended up dead as well in Las Vegas um, in a hotel room of, you guessed it, a drug overdose. There you so, go. You know, it's, 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 it's incredible here what's going on. And you know what? Thank God the world doesn't run like this anymore. You know, I mean, it's just uh, not. Don't that, be so sure, Stephen. Don't be so sure. Uh, it's, it's just not like this. You know, I mean, this is, the world has changed. But we do have to come to the realization that there are bad people in this world. But I, I don't think that, um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, things are quite this bad. I think we've improved, you know. I, I hope so. Improved. Let's go to the wild card line. Walt is in Pennsylvania. Walt, good morning. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Hi, Richard. It's good to talk to you once again. Likewise. Richard, I just want to first uh, extend my best wishes to Dave Schrader and his family for what they're undergoing. I I hope it all works out well for Dave. I've, I've spoken to him a couple of times, and he's a great guy. It's uh, difficult, uh, you know, to be a father with a sick child, and uh, all our our uh, our, ho- our hearts are out there uh, for him, and, and we're praying hard. Richard, uh, with all due respect to your guest, I think uh, you're ignoring uh, two things. Uh, that undoubtedly played uh, a great part in Elvis's demise. And uh, one is, was his, his reckless abandoned lifestyle, his devil may care lifestyle. And the other was uh, his genetics. I mean, uh, he ate, uh, I, I read where he would eat uh, these fried uh, bacon sandwiches. He'd eat a, a whole pound of bacon that were made, and then they'd put peanut butter and cheese and a banana on it. I mean, this guy was getting cholesterol and, and trans fats by the ton, Richard. Well, but Walt, you heard Stephen, uh, this came right from the person who held Elvis's heart in his hand and examined it in the autopsy, Dan Warlick. Well, Steve, you tell him. What did Dan Warlick find? Hi, Walt. It's just nice to talk to you. Uh, he may not have been listening. This is a long show. He may not have been listening when I covered that. He may not have done so. Um, Dan Warlick is the person who was at Elvis Presley's autopsy who actually dissected Elvis Presley's heart. And in doing so, he cut it, he thinly sliced it every quarter inch and looked through it to see if he could find some sort of artery blockage or uh, hemorrhage or uh, something. And they said that Elvis was years, years away from any sort of heart disease. So as far as, you know, it's sad that, 
and I've read those things too, okay? Um, it's sad that when someone passes, people like to pick apart their cracks. And, you know, they will make fun of his diet and his lifestyle. And when I see these people who think they're dressed like Elvis and they try and make fun of him, uh, it just it upsets me terribly. So I understand what happens after someone dies. They try and pick apart the cracks and they, you know, they get into these, these exaggerations of things. Um, you know, I mean, he definitely liked his fried foods. He liked his southern foods, so you can't deny that. But, I mean, the, the gross tonnage that he allegedly ate, you know, people came to that assumption because, again, he had, at the autopsy, they did this thing called running the gut, and it's terrible to talk about. They take a flat-billed pair of scissors, and they cut up the intestine to see what the last meal was. When they did that with Elvis Presley, he was jammed with white, clay-like fecal matter. This guy hadn't had a bowel movement in probably a month. So when he took on that bloated appearance, people, you know, tried to put two and two together, and then these, these stories came about. You know, I mean, he loved his southern food. He did have an appetite. But I think, I think people went a little far with that sometimes. All right, Walt. So, uh, right from Dan Warlick's mouth to to our ears, it uh, he did not have heart disease. Uh, let's say hi to Frank in Hollywood, Maryland. Frank, good morning. Howdy, hey guys. Glad to be back uh, with you. Um, I got a question. Um, who who had insurance on him, and and how much, to your knowledge? And can you put insurance on a person without their permission? And I got a, uh, uh, a question for you about about his music. All right. So you mentioned Lloyd's of London. Uh, they had an insurance policy with Lloyd's. The, the rumor was that was never cashed. Is, is that true, Steve? You know, I've. Uh, are you talking to him or me? I'm talking to you, Steve. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I've heard that too. Um, I don't know. First of all, I'm not an insurance expert. I don't know. I believe that you can put an insurance policy on someone, anyone, I think, as long as they get their premium. I don't think they would care. That's my guess. I don't, I don't have anything to judge that by. It's in the case of Elvis Presley. Um, I had heard um, that there, was, there were insurance policies on him that were never cashed in. I have no proof to that. I have no idea. And this brings me back to this Elvis Alive thing. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned this. I'm glad somebody called in because I forgot to touch on this. These Elvis Alive people are finding a few things. The, the, the nine-tenths of it is crap. And a lot of them are lookalikes because Susanna Lee blew the lid off something when she was in Paradise Hawaiian style with this guy. Elvis Presley had one, if not two, I believe two people who were surgically altered who would pass in a crowd to look like Elvis Presley. And this was done so they could continue shooting on set, on set while Elvis was laying down the soundtracks for the movie. So she said the first four or five scenes that she did weren't even with Elvis. And when you look, look at the, the photos, she told me which photos they are, they look exactly like Elvis. So these people are spotting these other people, and that this is where these, these things are coming from. Um, now, back to the things um, that people are finding, concrete evidence. This has been planted for them to find, to spin their minds away. Because the more time we spend looking for a live Elvis, the less time we spend solving probably the most unknown cold case murder in history. And it's being done on purpose. They're, they're good at this. Is the killer still out there? Is he still alive? I doubt it. I doubt it. You're you're 40 years past now. Um, I I I I would doubt that. And this is why I wrote this book. And, and I have to be. I have to elaborate on this. You'll never find a bigger Elvis fan than me. Okay. I grew up. My mother fell in love with this guy um, when she saw him for the first time on television. His first television uh, appearance on the Dorsey Brothers show. So I grew up spinning the original 45s. And when I started researching this, I just did it as, I, first of all, I, you know, I never believed what they said when he died. I remember where I was. You have those moments in your life that are etched in your mind. Never believed it. So it started out just to be casual bedtime reading for me. And I got into book after book after book. And when I finally put two and two together, 
I had no interest in writing a book on Elvis. And when I finally put two and two together, that, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole other side to the story, then I started to realize they planted codeine to set up, you know, you know the whole cover-up thing. Steve, we've got to take a time out. We'll come back and uh, take some more calls. Who Murdered Elvis? Here's Elvis with Suspicious Minds, which was recorded at Graceland in 1969. Back with more in a moment here on Coast to Coast AM. And a, uh, a late-breaking report from our former colleague here at Coast to Coast AM, Dave Schrader. He tells us that his uh, daughter is resting peacefully tonight, but she's not out of the woods yet. So your continued prayers are uh, asked for. A couple of uh, fun Elvis facts uh, just before we head back into our uh, phone-in segment with author Steve Ubaney, the author of Who Murdered Elvis. Elvis wore a cross. We all know he was a, a religious uh, gentleman. He wore a cross, but he also wore a Star of David around his neck. And he used to say, I don't want to miss out on heaven due to a technicality. Uh, in 1954, just two years before Elvis's big break, he auditioned for an amateur gospel quartet called the Songfellows. And guess what? They turned him down. And finally, on 11, uh, Elvis's 11th birthday, he was greatly disappointed when he received a guitar. He'd been hoping for a bicycle. All right, back to your phone calls, questions and comments for Steve Ubaney, Who Murdered Elvis, right here on Coast to Coast AM. Steve Ubaney, author of Who Murdered Elvis, whomurderedbooks.com, whomurderedbooks.com. You've also written a book on uh, FDR. And you've got some more in the works, uh, Princess Diana, uh, Nik Nikola Tesla, uh, and, and who else? Well, I have to dip my toe into the JFK realm because I have so many friends in that in that uh, in that arena. So I was I was good friends with um, Mark Lane, who wrote originally Rush to Judgment, who's friends with JFK and RFK actually, and uh, he wrote uh, Rush to Judgment, um, questioning the findings of the Warren Commission. And the Warren Commission, you talk about confirmation bias. Um, so I, uh, he, you know, my friendship with him got me in, in invo interested and in, in involved in the JFK thing. So there's a book coming on that. I've interviewed some people that I don't think anybody has yet. All right. Whomurderedbooks.com. Let's say hi to uh, Joe on the wild card line. He's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Joe, good morning. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? I'm terrific. How are you? I'm hanging in there. It, love the topic. Um, I know earlier it was touched on uh, Tom Parker and how he wasn't who he said he was. My question is, has anybody looked at Joe Esposito, who was born in Chicago in 38? Um, there was also another famous Joe Esposito in Chicago who died in 1929, who was a famous bootlegger. Uh, to coincide with the mob and the mafia helping Elvis get into the military. Steve, what can you tell us about Joe Esposito? Does any of this, uh, have, have you come across any of this before? Hi, Joe. Uh, thanks for your call. Um, I, I actually have. And um, there were, <laughs> this, this was a joke with the Memphis mafia amongst the guys because there was, Diamond Joe Esposito, who apparently was a different Joe Esposito, who, you know, was, <laughs> well, when he would get in trouble, they would make fun of Joe Esposito in, in, in Elvis's Memphis Mafia. So he picked up, they, they labeled him, the Elvis Joe, Diamond Joe Esposito, kind of as a joke. Uh, I haven't looked into him. I mean, Joe Esposito was just, he was just a high class guy. You know, I mean, I, I really haven't looked in any deeper than that. Um, like I said, I know a lot of people who had firsthand hands-on contact with the Memphis Mafia. And beyond that, I know nothing more about Joe Esposito. Outside of the fact that he was, you know, he was very pivotal in running, helping run things. You know, he worked hand-in-glove with Tom Parker to get the show on the road. And he was a no-nonsense guy. So beyond that, I, I really haven't looked into Joe Esposito's background or anything like that. Thanks for that, Joe. What, Steve, was Joe Esposito uh, and, let's say, uh, Sonny West, were they more loyal to Colonel Tom or were they loyal to Elvis? 
Well, it got to the point, well, Colonel Tom, okay, um, it, it got to the point where, you know, Joe was obviously loyal to Elvis. I mean, obviously, you can't say he wasn't. But he started to side and be a little closer um, because of the shenanigans that were going on inside the Memphis Mafia. You know, he was the road manager. You know, he, it pissed him off. I need to get the show on the road, knock it off. And it would impede his doing his job. So he would side with Colonel Parker, and he actually became Colonel Parker's kind of little spy as to who was goofing around and impeding the progress of the show. So he was always loyal to Elvis, but he also had a little alliance with Colonel Parker to get the show on the road and stop the foolishness. So as far as uh, Sonny West is concerned, and these guys both died. Everybody died in 2017, which is terrible. But um, they they lived out their lives, and you know, unfortunately, we have to lose people like this through natural causes. Sonny West, I don't, you know, he seemed to be a little bit more um, Colonel Parker friendly. They were all loyal to Elvis, but you know, some people. You know, like Colonel Parker a little more than others. The greater majority of them loathed them, uh, loathed him. Um, Sonny West didn't seem to. He seemed to feel that uh, Colonel Parker was very maligned in history. I personally think if there's someone who was maligned, I think it was Dr. Nicopolis. Um, and he wrote his own book about Elvis being murdered. And if you go to my website, whomurderedbooks.com, go under the Elvis tab. And you can watch the video of him saying Elvis was murdered. So I think he was the most maligned. But as far as Colonel Parker is concerned, there weren't very many people inside the group that were close with him, but apparently those two had some sort of an understanding with him. Uh, let's go east of the Rockies. Steve is in Manhattan. Steve, good morning. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Hi, are you? Um, there's actually a uh, conspiracy theorists to say that the, the Zabruder film on JFK was faked. Hello. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. There was a conspiracy he did, he did, theory. He did a book. He did. A, Steve did a book on on JFK. So the Zabruder film was faked on JFK. A lot of people believe. Conspiracy theorists believe, and also uh, a lot of people believe. Uh, there's a lot of those. Uh, Joel Gilbert did the mockumentary about Elvis faking his death, and it could possibly be there's some evidence of that. That he did fake his death. Yes. Well, also, Steve, you had shows. Steve you. Yeah, Steve, you 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 addressed this earlier, but you want to repeat what you said about all of these clues about him faking his death and who planted those? Well, um, hi, Steve. Thanks for your call and thanks for your question. Um, it's been an awful long show, um, Richard. You know, a lot of times people are tuning in, so they don't know what was covered earlier in the show. So, as far as the Zabruder film and JFK, um, be, you know, being being fake. Um. There are so many altered um, clips on the Internet now, because now we have the technology to do so. You have to go back to the original. I happen to be friends with a man named Steve Joffe, Steve Joffe, who was the sole surviving member of the Garrison Commission, who was responsible for going to France and bringing the original Zabruder film to America. Um, I don't believe the, origi the original copy, I don't believe, was faked. But I do think that things have been done to it, and I don't think very many people have the original. So to answer your question about that, number one, it wouldn't surprise me um, in, the, in the world that we live in of computer technology, uh, if someone could have changed the images, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I know that I've seen the original, and what I'm seeing on the Internet looks nothing like it. It's actually being doctored to make it look like there was the, the head came apart from behind. Okay, in my book there are two pictures because I touch on this. There are two pictures of JFK's um, shot from the side, and his head opened up like a Jordan almond. And if you look at the autopsy picture, it's all back together again. So those pictures are both on my in my book just because I talk about the similarities and the sanitized death scene and everything with Elvis Presley, because all of these things kind of fit together. So you might find that interesting in that book. There's a lot in that book. As far as evidence that uh, Elvis faked his death, um, nine-tenths of it is ridiculous, but there is some. 
and it's being planted there for people to find. And the government is good at this. They um, Nixon expanded COINTELPRO, which is a counterintelligence program where they would plant documents or make things up to spin or you know do whatever they had to do to get what they needed to do. The FBI actually. J. Edgar Hoover was having a problem early on in the FBI because he was delivering bad guys and they were walking scot-free. So the new FBI resorted to some different tricks, and they were highly effective. And Richard Nixon expanded that to get done what was necessary to get done in the wake of the radical 60s. So they were one of the pers- one of the people I met, and I can't remember her name, I apologize. It's awful late here on the East Coast. Um said that uh, Elvis Phil let his own autopsy report, or death certificate, I'm sorry, death certificate. And they had a hand, hand, uh, handwriting analyst look at it and then verified it. Doesn't surprise me at all, because we're talking about this and not solving the murder. They're good at spinning things. Now, why would the government? I understand why the the mob wanted him dead, and I understand why Colonel Tom wanted him dead because he was worth worth more dead than alive. But why would the FBI and the government be covering that up? Why would they want Elvis dead? He was a patriot. Well, first of all, you know, both of the like I said, the world doesn't work like this anymore. But you have to put yourself back in context. They leaked the FBI and the mob back then leaked like a sieve back and forth, and you know, one would get a document and the other one would know it right away. You know, so Elvis got it to this federal narcotics badge, and he was abusing it. And there was one instance in particular that I got from a first-hand account where he thought that a man had stolen one of his favorite diamond rings, and Elvis loved his rings. And he was at the airport, and he was going. He was on the plane, and the plane was going down the runway. Here comes Elvis Presley, flashing a federal narcotics badge, stops the plane, goes on the plane, roughs the guy up. Um, and he didn't have the ring. So it was because of things like this that, you know, <laughs> the federal government it, it became an embarrassment. So they weren't necessarily thrilled with him either. So, again, here we are. The both, they both leave back and forth like a sieve, and documents were planted. Documents are planted. All right, I, let's say... I have, I have no doubt that they are finding things. And I was one of those Elvis Elias people, too, until I heard the other side of the story. So don't make fun of those people. They are finding things. Uh, let's say hi to George in Akron, Ohio. George, good morning. Welcome to Coast. Uh, yes, I was fortunate enough to work with a gentleman who was the son of Elvis's pilot. And I kept this secret. I was sworn to secrecy for years. And since he's dead, I'm going to share this secret. I asked him, I said, Is, did Elvis fake his life? his death. Is he alive? And he said, yes. He said, That's all I'll tell you. Except he had help with the government, and he's alive. So, between that, there's other things. When you look at the interview with Mac Davis, he knew he had to fake his death to get any kind of a life. You look at uh, one other guy I worked with, a uh, black man who has a house behind Elvis. He had Elvis with a motorcycle with a helmet on. He says, who is that? Coming through my yard. Oh, it's Elvis. Well, I just, people don't know that I can take this motorcycle, go out in public, and keep the helmet down. Nobody knows. So the man definitely knew that he was in a bubble and he needed to get out. And that's what I'm going to share with you. And name ain't George ain't from Akron. That's for my own security reasons. But I can tell you, that's what I know. All right, George. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, do you want to weigh in on that, Steve, or shall we move on? No, no, I can weigh in on that. George, thanks for calling in. I like to hear things like this. These little stories are terrific. Um, I, Elvis was in a bubble, and he was smart. Elvis is a very smart man. He knew what was going on, and he knew he was kind of trapped. Um, if Elvis was had faked his death, and of course we've talked about lookalikes and everything all over the place, um, if he had faked his death, um, Jerry Schilling, one of Elvis's fiercest and you know most loyal friends upon hearing Elvis's song on the radio, the late Elvis Presley, right after he died, punched a concrete wall so hard he shattered his hand. I doubt he would have done that if the man was alive. 
And I also don't think that Lisa Marie would be going through the struggles that she has going through right now if Elvis is secretly alive. So I'm not discounting what you're saying. I'm just saying it doesn't make logical sense. It does, doesn't fit into what, what the equations are. All right, George, thanks nonetheless for that. Mike is in Norfolk, Virginia. Mike, good morning. Welcome to Coast. Hi. Um, Steve, uh, I haven't read your book. Um, I'm going to. I, I'm, uh, I'll tell you something that I've always just kind of discounted, although uh, because of the source of the information, I never really wanted to discount it. Um, a guy who served in um, the branch that I served in um, several years before. Um, we were sitting around with a, a four or five of us and over beers, and this gentleman had, like many of us in this particular branch, which I kind of wish I'd fibbed about where I was calling from <laughs> because I, I don't want to talk about that. Um, this gentleman uh, served in a branch, as did I, that, that a lot of retirees become security people and he claimed and then shut up even though he was he was he was keeping up with us us youngsters <laughs> with the beers that night um he mentioned that that he had been part of a security team uh that worked at graceland and with with elvis and that there was and this forgive me if this if you've talked about this or if it was in the book um, he mentioned something about a security shakeup right before um, Elvis's death that concerned him and, and his other teammates. And he he clearly thought that there was something something um, a foul that happened. Uh, is is there anything in the record about? A security shape up, a shake up of personnel um, with with his security team just before his death. Did, does that ring a bell? Does that make any sense? Well, thanks for your call. It makes perfect sense. Um, and you'll love my book because I go. I can only cover so many things in the amount of time. Um, you know, you know, just buy the book. You'll love it, and pass it on to somebody else, and they'll love it too. Because I cover almost everything. All the questions here. Um, as I said earlier, in, in 76, Elvis almost went bankrupt. And he had to, his father felt it necessary to let go of three bodyguards. And they were pivotal, long-trusted, held bodyguards. Red West, Sonny West, who were cousins, and Dave Hebler. Um, Red West went to high school with Elvis, was one of Elvis's fiercest protectors. These were rough boys. They were the heart of the security team, and they were cut loose, and they weren't happy about it. So it makes perfect sense. And to fill those shoes, other people had to start taking on responsibilities that were over their heads. And I'm not going to mention any names um, because it's not necessary to, but it makes perfect sense what you're saying. And one of Elvis's chief of security... A uh, man named Dick Robb, who I hope I meet sometime. I've mentioned him a lot. I hope I meet him. He 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 completely believes Elvis Presley was murdered. So what you're saying does make perfect sense. I'm not going to discount it, and uh, I believe that whoever told you that is uh, is relaying a factual account. Stephen, we are uh, out of time. I don't. I can't believe where these three hours have gone. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Richard. Steve Ubaney, WhoMurderedBooks.com, Who Murdered Elvis, the true story they don't want you to know. For George Norrie, George Napoli, Lyons, Stephanie Smith, Tom Danheiser, Dan Galanti, uh, Sean Ladisor, uh, Nathan Staten, Donna Walker, Chris Burroughs, and here in Toronto, Mike Ben Dixon, Robert Turner, and Patrick O'Neill, I'm Richard Serrett. Thank you for your ears and your voices, your beautiful voices. From Coast to Coast AM, so long for now.
and what did he balloon up to by the time he died? That's certainly another point of, of, of debate among Elvis fans. Um, some people say he got up to 250, 255. Some people say he, you know, kind of plateaued around the 235 area. Um, I would say looking at him in those last years, a lot of that seemed to have been uh, weight from bloating. Um, so I would I would give him two thirty five, two forty, maybe two fifty at, at his at his. Height. Well, we, we saw what happened to Jerry Lewis when they had him on uh, drugs for his uh, for his back problem. Yeah, I mean he was huge. Yeah, and I wonder if something like that happened to Elvis. Well, there was also a, a couple of times going through like nineteen six or seventy six, nineteen seventy seven, where you would see photographs of him in concert and he would look trim and healthy and yeah and, and then uh, two weeks later you'd see photos from another concert where he would look bloated and out of sorts and his face would be a little bit pasty and you know some of that was from the makeup but it, it, he he the, the, his appearance seemed to to vary a lot in those years from between good and and not so good okay tell us about the death that night of that morning of what happened to him um, as the official story goes, he went into the bathroom to read around 9 o'clock that morning, um, told his fiancée, Ginger, that he was going into the bathroom to read. Um, there was a toilet, of course, in there and a chair. There's there's debate, um, a lot of debate on, on where he well, was sitting in the bathroom. Where he was sitting, yeah. Um, Ginger got up around 2.20 or so, found the body, called downstairs for help, um, Joe Esposito, Al Strada, um, probably Charlie Hodge came upstairs. Um, when Joe Esposito turned the body over um, a little bit to, to take a look at what was going on, um, it was obvious to him that rigor mortis had set in because the knees and, and some of the extremities had rema remained flexed, mm -hmm. and his body was not moving as a normal body would move. Um, from that point, they got uh, a fire department ambulance, two paramedics up to the house, and the, the paramedics, I think they probably were pretty clear on what was going on there and that Elvis had been dead probably for several hours. Um, because of who he was, it would be the standard argument of, well, why did, why did you take him to the hospital? Why did you, um, you know, spend 30 minutes trying to revive him, which is what they did. And, uh, and I think it's because of who he was, and they had to let the public know that we made an effort to save this man, even though right. he was dead. He was literally stone dead. Yeah, and um, I mean, if you talk to people who saw the body that day, it was quite obvious that he was no longer living when he got to the hospital. Okay, now, uh, there's been rumors that at the time, you know, now people call TMZ and things like that, uh, and the National Enquirer was there. Did anybody call them before they called the ambulance? I do not believe that, and I don't believe there's any evidence for that. Um, that claim has been has been floating around for a number of years, and it's based on some claims from a, a reporter for the Enquirer named Jim Kirk, and one of uh, the head security uh, guys for Elvis named Dick Grobe has has put that story out. Um, I don't see any evidence for it, um, and the National Enquirer was not there shortly after the death. And as I discuss in the book, there's just the way that Grobe tells the story, it seems more like it was pieced together as a piece of fiction um, because the facts don't really hold up. Was he healthy? I don't think so, right? I do not believe he was healthy at all, no. Do, do we know what was wrong with him? Um, he had hypertension. Um, in some numbers that I've seen in my research have been extremely high and would make me wonder how on earth he could have been going out on, on the tours that he did and why he was allowed to go out on the tours that he did. Um, he had some problems with his eyes. Um, he had a colon problem. Um, part of the colon problem and, and some of these other things were, were made worse by the drug intake, Dilaudid being one of the key drugs mm -hmm. that he used back then, which pretty much shuts the colon down. And... Um, so by by when we get past seventy four into seventy five, but really seventy six to seventy seven, you can see the health problems, you know, visually when you when you look at photographs of him and see video footage, and um, it was just obvious by looking at him that he was ill, and you know you have to wonder, you know, I guess twenty twenty or hindsight being twenty twenty, you look at those photos and you're like, you know, why wasn't somebody doing something with this man? Yeah, yeah, or was he so bullheaded, Patrick, that 
You couldn't tell them what to do. Well, I, you know, a lot of the Memphis Mafia guys uh, make that claim, and I, I, I used to hold a view opposite to that, where I thought, you know, so the guy was hard headed and he was obstinate in this and that. You, you got to get the guy some help. However, in in my research of Elvis, in terms of his psychology and the personality he had, I've I've changed my my view of that, you know, 180 now, where I agree with the way that the guys from the Memphis Mafia viewed that situation, because. Elvis Presley was a unique, um, was in a very unique position, not only based on his career and his successes and things like this, but his psychology. Um, it's hard to think about how does a person live like he did, being at the pinnacle of not only your your chosen career field, but you're looked at as as a god by some people. Yeah, um, you're held up to a standard that a lot of people just can't measure up to on a day to day basis, and even today, I believe that's still true. People still view him that way. What was the cause of death? The official cause of death was cardiac arrhythmia. Um, that his heart had gone into a, that's, that's very rapid beating, yeah, right? A, a, a lethal um, change in in the heartbeat, um, and that was they say based on um, some heart disease and uh, that kind of thing. But one thing that's interesting about cardiac arrhythmia, though, is it's very much of a a catch all when you're not really sure what happened to the heart. It's just, well, we don't know what happened to the heart, so we're going to say cardiac arrhythmia because it covers any unspecific cardiac problem. And they performed an autopsy on him? They did, yes. Yeah. Is Has that been sealed? Well, it's, that's another point of contention in, in Elvis world and has been for a number of years. A lot of people say that that um, autopsy report was sealed by Vernon Presley or at his request because he's the one who requested the autopsy. The fact of the matter, though, is that that autopsy is a private medical record, and it has not been sealed by the court because it's not under the court's power to do so. They have no authority over that report. So that report is held by the Presley estate, and it will never be released because there's nobody who has the authority uh, to make it be released. Patrick, based on the way he looked, what was going on in his life at the time, mm -hmm. his frustrations, could you see him at that time faking his death in 1977? No. I just... But the, when I started researching Elvis stuff, and I'll just say stuff because I looked at a lot of different things, um, I looked at these these claims that he had faked his death. And I guess we think about the concept of faking your death almost as a normal point of discussion about Elvis, but the fact is that's a very, very bizarre, weird thing to do or to even think about. You know, imagine sitting down saying, hey, I think I'm going to fake my death. You know, what would your reasons possibly be? Gary, do you share that, that uh, you don't think he faked his death or he, or he wasn't capable of doing it? It would be very strange to sit down and say, mm, in August of 1977, I'm just going to uh, fake my Fade death, away. give up my entire career, and just drop out. And, of course, I know, and uh, we're going to talk about this later, I'm sure, with Patrick, but you know, the idea that he was in a witness protection program because he had turned in some uh, mobsters on drug charges and that he had to, to save his life by doing that, it seems real easy to create an answer later. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You could say, well, you know, he, he actually did this for a reason, and, and, and you go through this. But, you know, that that's the thing to me. I mean, I just don't think he sat down. I think the thing was not well planned to do this, and it would be impossible to really hide underground because how much money would somebody get if they said, this is Elvis Presley, this is where he lives. Listen, money betrays everybody. This would be a billion-dollar project, wouldn't it, Patrick? Yeah, the, the scope of a hoax like this would be so broad and it would have tentacles going out everywhere in terms of EPE's business, in terms of the, the city of Memphis's business, um, medical professionals in Memphis, police department, investigators, Tennessee State Board of Health. It would, it would, too, it would be too massive to keep under wraps for 31 years. Patrick, does it bother you when you hear so many stories and rumors about Elvis still being alive? Um. It does in the sense that if somebody believes these things, that's fine. But I think they, they kind of have a responsibility to research them and try to, try to some way substantiate the beliefs that they have. 
a lot of people, well, most people, if not all people, who believe that Elvis faked his death don't do any research on it. They take these standard claims that have been floating around for 20, 25 years now, and they just spew those over and over and over again, and they never do any work to try to see what's true, what's not true, where these claims came from. Um, so in the sense, I mean, when somebody says, well, Elvis faked his death, my, my first reaction is, well, you know, that kind of disparages his, his, the, the man, and it, and it makes him look kind of foolish. You know, gee, Elvis, you know, you faked your death. Um, but, but I just, if somebody believes that Elvis faked his death, I think they ought to come up with the evidence or they shouldn't say it. Okay, Gary, let's, uh, well, join me here as we talk with Patrick and uh, just kick around these various stories about right. Elvis, whether he's alive or not, the theories of. We've, of course, Patrick says, no way you believe that as well. There is, Patrick, some kind of a photo. They call it the infamous pool house photo that many people believe is Elvis Presley, taken in January 1978. Tell me about that picture and what happened. Um, the photo was taken by a gentleman named Michael Joseph, and it's taken um, facing um, north towards the house, um, facing what was the, what the pool house at the time. And inside the door, there is a chair there, and it appears that there's a figure sitting there. And because of the way the hair appears and the eyes and the, and the facial structure appear, that a lot of people say that that was Elvis accidentally captured in that photo. Um, in my in, in, in looking at the photo more closely, there's a lot of photographic um, anomalies with that photograph. And if we stick with just the figure that people say is there, the hair, if you, if you really closely look at that photograph, the hair really doesn't look like Elvis's at all. And, you know, Elvis in the 70s wore those dark sunglasses that have become, you know, so associated with him now. But if you really look at the photograph, the, the pool house photo, very closely, the shading around the eyes is not um, a pair of sunglasses. It's some type of other shading. And if you look at the shape of the shading, it's actually triangular. It is not the shape of sunglasses. So that the glasses right there are one reason that people think that that's Elvis. But if you remove that, you're just left with what appears to be a man sitting there whose hair doesn't look like Elvis's. So there's really not a lot of support for that being Elvis, although when you first look at it, it does appear to be somebody that resembles him. Gary, wasn't there a, a cousin of Elvis who was at the funeral who said the body was not Elvis Presley's? I don't know if it's someone in his family. Uh, I've heard that there were remarks made by people saying that it was a wax dummy, and I know that, that Patrick wants to go in. I had a good conversation with uh, Carl Perkins, and Perkins was there, and he said that was Elvis in the coffin. And, I mean, Carl Perkins is one of the most warm, sincere people you would ever meet, and I think that sort of helped change my mind. But, you know, George, you and I both, we want to believe. I mean, this would be fascinating if something like this happened. And what we have to have, we have to have something that's so concrete that it gives us a chance. And and when I was when I was listening to Patrick talk, I mean, he's, he was saying that you know that a lot of this is accepted. Let me give you one. Uh, you remember the rumor that said that Elvis died at the same age of his mother? Remember that yes, one? Yes, yes. I yes. hear it everywhere. Well, Elvis, his mother, I believe Patrick wasn't she forty six when she died, and wasn't Elvis forty two? You are correct. And, you know, they weren't. But who did their research? I mean, that was very easy to find out, to do that. Well, the, Gary makes an interesting point there, is that when you look at a lot of these claims that are made, the research to, to prove or disprove the information that, that you're, you're looking at is typically very easy. It doesn't take a lot of research to, to find out the information that you want to find on this. And, and the, the example that Gary uses there is, is perfect, and it shows that people just accept things that they want to accept, and a lot of this has to do with that they want to believe that Elvis faked his death, and so they, 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 they take facts like that, and they don't follow up on them, and then these facts just become facts, you know, year after year after year, where pretty soon nobody even questions them anymore. Another example is the claim that, you know, a, a guy named John Burroughs was seen at the Memphis airport buying a plane, a plane ticket to South America on the day that Elvis died. Well, does anybody do any research on that? No, they don't. They just they just say the claim over and over and over again. And, but you have to go back to that claim and say, who saw this man? You know. And if somebody saw Elvis Presley buying a plane ticket on August sixteenth, seventy seven, why didn't they call the police or call the newspaper or something? You know. And, and where did this? Who 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 saw this man? And who who, who and, and the person who saw that man? Who did they tell? 
where did this story come from? And nobody knows. And and I contacted the, the Memphis airport, and they didn't even sell plane tickets to South America in 1977. So it's, huh. it's easily disproved. Who is Bill Beanie? Bill Beanie is a gentleman who claims to have DNA evidence that um, Elvis, the body that was autopsied, was not um, Elvis Presley. All right, now with this evidence, I mean, where's he taking it? Well, what he did is he, there's a lot of discrepancy on, on the facts of the time behind this story, too. He claims to have been in contact with a, a physician in Memphis who provided him with these tissue samples. And Beanie had these tissue samples tested, and he determined, um, or he says the test determined, that the, uh, the 1975 tissue sample from Elvis did not match the autopsy body. Now, Beanie refuses to tell us how he got these samples, and, and he says, well, I got them from this physician. But if he doesn't name the physician, then we don't know where he got the samples. And he came forward with this claim. Good point. But just like every other claim about Elvis being alive, he makes the claim, he goes public with it, but then when he's asked for the evidence, he says, I'm not going to give it to you. What can you tell us, uh, Patrick, about the Presley Commission? Um, the Presley Commission was a group of people. Um, I'm not sure how many people. There was, was supposed to be 22, 25 people. Um, only about four or five of them have come forward and admitted that they were part of that group. Um, they put together this group in maybe the late 80s, or the, the Presley Report that they put together came out in 94, I think. And they said that they were going to research and analyze and investigate the, the circumstances surrounding the death and then give an objective report on what they found and you know did these claims about Elvis dying actually stand up when they were researched um, their conclusions were that Elvis faked his death and literally every single fact that we have supports that so they went into it with an idea that we're gonna try to prove that Elvis faked his death and we're gonna twist and mold and bend all the information to that end hey Corey what is the Memphis Mafia how do they feel when they hear all these rumors that Elvis is still around, does that bother them? Yeah, you know, the majority of them that I know, it does bother them because I think they take it as such a direct insult to to the memory and legacy of Elvis and to their friendship that they had with him. And, you know, I think at this point, after all these years, they just find it so completely absurd and they're so tired of hearing it. And it just, you know, it goes from there with them. I mean, the one... One Memphis, Memphis Mafia member, Marty Lacker, that I speak with, you know, he's he's very blunt and vocal and honest with his answers, and he he gets very very upset about it. Um, some of the other guys are a little bit more quiet about it, but you know, and it shows the depth of their friendship and loyalty that they had to him, and it really shows what Elvis meant to them, and and how upset they get when they hear these stories. Over a year ago, I had uh, Ray Manzarek and Robbie Krieger and the Doors members, the surviving Doors members, and we were talking about the life of Jim Morrison and also the possibility that Jim faked his death. And both Ray and Robbie looked at me. They were in the studio at the time in Los Angeles, Corey, and they just shook their head and went, he's dead. <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, it's time, I guess, they want to move on. Well, that's it, and and there's so much more to talk about with the memory of Elvis Presley than than about the 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 nonsense of the live rumors and the long lost sons or daughters or whatever new scheme somebody dreams up year after year. You know, there, he was so much more than than the the people get. You know, they, they get the tip of the iceberg of the absurd a lot of times with the tabloid type stories, and it really does an injustice to Elvis. You know what's so amazing now, Corey, is the amount of money the estate is making now. Uh, I, I would guess Elvis is making more money dead than alive. Well, and he he definitely is now, and the estate is. I mean, considering the fact of, of Elvis's career, you know, from the 50s to the 70s and the way that money was worth then compared to now, yeah. he essentially has made more money being deceased than when he was alive. Let's talk about Elvis as a kid, when he was growing up into the music world. What got him interested in music, Corey? Well, you know, Elvis, of course, was, was born and raised in Tupelo, Mississippi. His family was very poor. They were very religious and church-going people. Elvis sang in the choir at church. Uh, he was raised Southern Baptist. And he really sunk his teeth into the gospel music. 
and he used to go down to an area of town called Shake Rag, and he would listen to the old blues musicians down there, and he really really took a liking to that music, and, and I think that really got him interested in it, and, and some of those old musicians would give him a, a lesson or two on how to play the guitar, and one of his uncles helped him how to play the guitar, and he just kept doing that, and you know, he, he took second place when he was 10 years old in the Mississippi, Alabama State Fair and got $5 and free rides to <laughs> all the amusement rides, and you know, and he just kept going on from there, and uh he just had such a, a deep appreciation for it, and he would sneak into the gospel quartet shows, and you know, and, and, and a funny story about that too that that comes full circle is J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet, who I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah, he used to go to their shows along with the Blackwood Brothers, and and he and he used to sneak in, and J.D. Sumner would let him you know sneak into the shows and and wouldn't say nothing to anybody. Well, years later when Elvis starts doing the touring again in the shows in Las Vegas and Lake Tahoe. Who does he hire to be his backup band? I but Jade, you know, our main backup singers, but uh, J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet. I love it. Well, I've so, heard the same. I, and I think, Gary, I think you may have told me this, but the uh, Beatles were the warm-up act for Roy Orbison when he was singing in London. Exactly. And, you know, uh, Elvis met the Beatles. And this was something, I don't know if Elvis is actually looking forward to it, but... What was odd, you know, we do this coast-to-coast -coast thing because we know the slant we like, but uh, the Beatles met Elvis on August 27, 1965 and in California, and they went to the house, and Elvis sat there and looked at them, and they sat politely and looked at him, and after a few minutes, Elvis said, look, if you guys aren't going to do anything, I'm just going to go ahead and go to bed. He said, if you want to jam, let's jam. And when he said that, they just lit up. And they went to the piano, and they played Chuck Berry songs, Elvis songs, Beatles songs. And uh, Elvis had actually had a Fender bass, and he played Paul McCartney's bass part to I Feel Fine. And Elvis said, very nice job on the bass, Elvis. You're coming along nicely. Uh, and this was great. And, I mean, McCartney says it was the highlight of his life. And in one interview, John Lennon told the author to tell Elvis that he said, if it wasn't for you, I would not be in the music business because he was so influential. So there was a tie there with the Beatles. The odd thing about it was August 27th, two years later, would be the day that Brian Epstein would die. And Epstein was the guy who arranged the meeting with Colonel Tom Parker. And, ta and uh, you guys were talking about the money thing with Graceland. You know, I think this is one thing that bothered Elvis was, and, and Corey, you can say this, but uh, didn't Parker get 50% of everything Elvis made? And I know that in one interview I read, I think they wanted him to play in England, and they were going to give him $28,000 to play a week. And Parker said, well, that's good enough for me, but what are you going to pay Elvis Presley? And I think Elvis started Jeez. to be suspicious of his management when I believe he was offered $1 million to play a, a number of cities in Australia. And then he was wondering why he had missed out. Because think of this, if Elvis had played in Europe, he never left the country, as far as I know. You know, Hawaii is still in the country, but he had never gone to Europe. How many millions of dollars could he have made? So maybe he was mismanaged a little. What do you think, Corey? Well, and, and that's definitely been one of the, the concerns that I've always had with the, the career dealings and decisions that Colonel Tom Parker made was, you know, Colonel Parker was, was absolutely fantastic and had such a knack for promotion. But he made such bad decisions that went along with the great decisions that he made, and I think it really held back Elvis a lot of the times, just like with not getting different movie roles, not being able to tour overseas, you know, things like that that really could have gave Elvis this challenge and really broadened his horizons and, and made the fans really get to see him. You know, and that's why Elvis is so popular in other countries, because of the fact he never toured there. A lot of the Elvis tribute artists uh, have great careers over there because these people crave anything Elvis. Well, and Par you, and Parker, by the way, he died in 1997, so he dies 20 years after Elvis died. Yeah, exactly. And he passed away in Las Vegas. He was 87 years old. And um, he, he had basically been banished from having anything to do with royalties and business-wise with anything that was associated with Elvis um, in a court case that had happened years before. But even with that, he had um, gotten like a $2 million one-time payout to not have anything do, to do with Elvis's name or likeness at that point. And that was about all they could do because Colonel Tom Parker being – a Dutch immigrant who was here legally basically said, well, you can't really do anything to me any further because I'm not even a, an American citizen. But, Corey, since he was an illegal alien, that would probably 
answer why he didn't set those tours up because he went with Elvis. And exactly. How he couldn't get a passport. To that was the country, correct. That was a huge reason of it. Was that. And also, uh, they actually were, in 1977, there was, there was plans to go to get Elvis set up to do a European tour. And they actually had plane tickets in hand. And then Charles Stone, one of the men that worked Concerts West, that, that did all the tours for in the 70s, was actually going over there to make the dealings. And But Elvis passed away. And so obviously that never materialized. On August 16, 1977, something happened in Memphis, Tennessee. It was either the death of Elvis Presley at the age of 42, as more than 80% of Americans believe, or the start of something most spectacular, a disappearing act in the biggest in the history of mankind. Well, this week, as fans mark the 40th anniversary of the King of Rock and Roll's passing, those who believe that Presley is still alive will have a golden opportunity to make their case, or rather, cases that Elvis is alive. These theories are as varied as they are plentiful, and they've been circulating since just after his death. In a moment, Corey Cooper joins us as we talk about the 40th anniversary of Elvis's death and some amazing stories about Elvis Presley. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Corey Cooper with us, Elvis historian, a frequent source for books, radio shows, movies, and television projects about Elvis Presley and his life and his music. Corey has a wealth of friends and contacts in the Elvis world that includes authors, performers, friends, and members of the Memphis Mafia, that close group of friends and employees that worked with and protected Elvis Presley every day of his life, even though he was very difficult to protect in some cases. Corey, back on Coast to Coast. I think it was about, geez, eight years ago, Corey? Was it that long? It has been a long time, George. Thanks for having me back on. It's good to have you, and what a uh, fascinating moment. I can't believe 40 years have clipped by already. Unbelievable. 40 years? Can you believe that? You know, and like everybody says, they remember where they were at when they heard that sad news. And where were you at, George? I was uh, in Detroit, Detroit, Michigan, and it was... Uh, I think we had heard about it in the afternoon, didn't we? Yeah, the, the, it would have been about, uh, well, it would have been late afternoon when the first came Around 5, 6 o'clock? Yeah. Something like that. And I was home, and I was just uh, prepared to go into work at a TV station, and uh, lo and behold, what a horrible story. Uh, but here's the big question to you. Is he dead, Corey? Sad to say, but yes. Elvis passed away on that August 16th day. Why do people try to keep the guy alive? Well, you know what it is, George? I mean, you, you look at Elvis, and you see certain times during his career, you see him in the, the Aloha from Hawaii special, you see him in the Singer special from 68, and that black leather. You know, he's vibrant, he looks perfect. You know, he's in the great outfits, he's singing the tunes, he's got all that charisma and talent, and people just can't imagine that that all went away. Yeah, and sadly, too, 40 years, 42 years old is awfully young, isn't it, for that? Oh, definitely, definitely young. You know, and Elvis, you know, he, he really had a hard time turning 40. And I, I guess, you know, trying to look back on that youth and everything. But, boy, when you think about it now, we've all, any of us that went past that age of 42, we know that's not that long at all. 
Joaquin Phoenix played uh, Johnny Cash and walked the line, and there was a scene where after uh, Joaquin got off the stage as Johnny Cash singing, the next guy up was Elvis Presley. Did those two cross paths? Yes, they most definitely did. Back in the early days, uh, they used to be uh, on the same marquee together and do uh, some regional and local shows together. So they definitely did know each other and toured together. Were they friends, do you know? Uh, you know, I, you know, it's, it's always hard when you, when you talk about friendships with Elvis because Elvis wasn't your typical celebrity. He didn't hang out a lot. You know, he didn't go to, to a lot of parties. You didn't see him out having fancy dinners. He kind of stayed to himself, stayed at his home. So when he, he definitely had friends and acquaintances, but uh, as far as, you know, friendships, Elvis had just a few and you know friends that were around him in his inner circle and but he obviously knew these people and didn't hang out with them but if they weren't they weren't hanging out having dinner every night let's go back to the beginning of elvis presley and his career when did he start really playing around with music as a little boy well you know what it was when he, you know, he was born in tupelo mississippi and he would go and listen to the, the gospel quartets and he would go to a part of town called shake rag and listen to some of the black musicians and you know, he taught, was taught guitar by his uncle, and, you know, he'd sneak into these shows and listen to the, the Blackwood Brothers, and, you know, and, and he really got the niche for that, and, and singing in church. And so the music was always there with him. And then we all know the story, you know, on his 11th birthday, he wanted a BB gun, and his mom bought him a guitar. <laughs> and what, what a move that was by her, huh? And he adored her, didn't he? Absolutely. I mean, his mother Gladys and Elvis were uh, very, very close, had a very uh, tight relationship. Uh, they said that she even used to walk him to school when he was still in high school. And, and sadly, when she passed away, Elvis was only uh, you know, in his early 20s. He was just starting to become the Elvis that we know, and she passed away. Way so too she young. Wasn't, you know, she wasn't there to, to see everything that Elvis was going to end up doing. Did Elvis play a lot of music in high school? I mean, was he in a, a high school band or anything like that? Well, he wasn't in a high school band. I mean, he did sing a little bit in, in, in class and, you know, talent shows was such like that in school. But uh, he was really kind of a loner as well. It was, you know, it's kind of funny when you think about the day that Elvis went to Sun Records there in Memphis to to make a record, they say, for his mom for her birthday. But her birthday had already passed, so... A lot of us kind of theorized that maybe Elvis just kind of wanted to hear what he sounded like and was testing the waters a little bit. But uh, he went in there and made a record for four bucks, and boy, <laughs> if I could say probably the best four dollars that's ever been invested. Who discovered Elvis, Corey? Well, Sam Phillips, who owned Sun Records is always credited with discovering Elvis, but what a lot of people might not know was the day that Elvis went into Sun Records, Sam wasn't even there that day, but his secretary, Marion Keister, was there. And she was the one that initially spoke with Elvis, and she was the one that told Sam when he came back, like, hey, you got to hear this guy, Sam, which, of course, you know, Sam brought him back in. So Marion Keister is kind of the unsung hero in, in all of the Elvis history. So when he cuts his first record... How does it get on radio stations? Who pushes it? Who promotes it? Well, the very first record that he went in there that he did when he paid his $4, that didn't necessarily get played on the radio. But what happened was uh, when, when he got the group together with Scotty Moore on guitar and, and Bill Blackwood on bass, stand-up bass, you know, that's when they... They went into the studio. They weren't really hitting on a lot of stuff. They wasn't making the sound that Sam Phillips wanted. They finally hit on That's All Right, Mama. And then that's the, that's the record that went and got played locally there by a DJ named Dewey Phillips in Memphis and who played the song like 12 times in a row or some outrageous <laughs> number. And, and Elvis was too nervous to even want to hear it, so he went to a movie theater, and they had to go find Elvis and tell him that it's being played and everybody's loving it. And so that that was like the first springboard into everybody's ears to hear Elvis. But of course, you know, that was just local there in Memphis, and of course it went crazy after that. When he got on the Ed Sullivan show, was he already well-known, or was it that TV show that really propelled him? 
No, 1956, in September of 56, was that first Ed Sullivan appearance. Elvis was already had been signed uh, to RCA Records. Uh, they bought his contract from Sam Phillips at Sun. And Elvis, that was a huge year. I mean, Elvis had already been on the stage show with the Dorsey Brothers, and, you know, he'd already been on, everybody knew. He was on the radar for sure. And so, you know, he'd already had his first number one hit with Heartbreak Hotel, and so he was already on his way to to superstardom at that point. And uh, then once he hit the uh, Ed Sullivan show, it just pushed him way, way over the top, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And the great thing that Ed Sullivan did is after Elvis's third and final appearance, he even said to the audience that, look, this is a fine, decent young boy because of all the controversy that had surrounded Elvis. And that was an amazing a shot of confidence for Elvis to get yeah, that from Ed Sullivan. It was a and great endorsement. Probably uh, solidified a little bit of parents to calm their fears a little bit. Were Sullivan's directors during that show saying, you, you can't shoot him below the waist, don't do any of that because of his gyrations? Yeah, and that was only on the third and final show that they did. Everybody thinks it was all three appearances, but it was just the third and final show that they did that to Elvis. People went nuts. Those girls went crazy, didn't they? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you see him crying and falling over and passing out. And how old would he have been during that time period, Corey? Uh, he was uh, 21 years old. Oh, my God, just a young guy. 21 years old. My gosh. At what point did he really become a superstar in Vegas? How old was he? Well, you know, Vegas was kind of a double-edged sword for Elvis because the initially brought Ellis out for some shows at the New Frontier in the 50s, and it didn't really go that well for Elvis at that point. You know, the audiences were older audiences. They really didn't get that type of music, and it wasn't all that great of a showing for him. But what made him into the pinnacle of that superstardom in Vegas is 13 years later when he started appearing back in Vegas in 1969. And then that's, of course which is kind of synonymous with the image of Elvis, with the jumpsuits and all the live footage that we see. A lot of that's from those shows. And he was just absolutely huge. And, of course, he uh, was picking up after the Frank Sinatra era. He was basically the new breed of singers then, wasn't he? Absolutely. You know, and nobody was like him, of course, which, you know, and I mean, that's the greatest thing about Elvis. Is, you know, there's so many aspects of him that were amazing. I mean, he was the American dream, American success story. Nobody looked like him. Nobody sounded like him. Nobody had that showmanship and charisma like him. I mean, there was just so many aspects that stood out above everybody else. And, of course, all of which fueled the teenagers even more when their hysteria over Elvis and made all the parents groan. It was uh, it was an incredible time period during all of that. Uh, I even remember on YouTube seeing a duet that he sang with Frank Sinatra. Yeah, well, that was a great show because uh, Elvis was had six minutes of time on that show and was paid one hundred twenty five thousand oh, dollars. Wow! Yeah, and that was uh, that was in nineteen sixty. And what had happened is Frank Sinatra uh, was doing a show from the Fountain Blue in Florida and brought Elvis on to sing a little duet, but it was also Elvis's like, first uh, big show after he got released from the military in 1960. When did the movies start for him, Corey? Well, he did He did a few. In the first movies, you know, he did in the 50s, 1956, when Love Me Tender first came out, which was initially titled The Reno Brothers, but then Love Me Tender, the single was out at the time, so of course... They wanted to capitalize on the mark and the aspect of that and renamed it Love Me Tinder. And then, of course, he did Loving You, Jailhouse Rock, and then King Creole, which he had to, at that time, when they began to film that, Elvis had already now gotten his draft papers to go in the Army. They actually had to give him a, a 60-day extension so he could finish the movie. But So when then Elvis came out in 1960, that's really when his manager, Park, Colonel Parker, kicked it in gear with those movie contracts. And then... For the next eight, nine years here in the 60s, Elvis didn't do any live performances and was basically churning out like three of those movies a year. He did Viva Las Vegas. That was a big hit, too, wasn't it? They, you know, that was a great thing, too, about those movies. A lot of people you know, wanted to pan those movies, but hey, we got to see Elvis, and Elvis never had a flop. Every single one of those movies made a profit. It's just that um, they took those profits 
and went and made bigger and better movies with all-star casts, and sadly Elvis didn't get the roles that he wanted. Corey, tell us about Colonel Parker. How did that relationship with Elvis occur? Well, Parker had already been managing um, like Hank Snow and, and Eddie Arnold and, and got word about Elvis and went and saw a show, and of course he was never going to not want to be Elvis's manager, so uh, Elvis talked with him and spoke with his his parents, and they all got together and struck a deal that would go until the day Elvis passed away. How uh, how tight was Colonel Parker with with Elvis? I mean, did he rule him with a dictatorial hand? Yeah, well, he he did he, he did and didn't. Um, you know, Colonel Parker is a double edged sword because, in my opinion, it's just as much good that he did for Elvis. He did just as much bad which was even evident really? in the court cases against Colonel Parker after Elvis passed away, where it was shown that he uh, overextended his management skills with Elvis on numerous occasions. I remember, Tom, I'm going to jump around a little bit here, but I remember uh, when, when something was wrong with Elvis, he ballooned up in terms of weight. He was just huge. Uh, and I remember a Vegas... Uh, video of him singing, and he was incoherent, uh, drunk or on drugs or something. What was wrong with him at that point? And then he lost his weight again and looked pretty good, didn't he? Well, Elvis didn't drink alcohol. Um, there was the alcoholism was in his family line. Elvis was not fond of alcohol, but sadly, uh, Elvis did have a problem with prescribed legal medications, which should be a great warning to anybody out there that, to, you know, Elvis was under the impression they're prescribed by a doctor, so everything's okay. And as we know, that's not the case at all. They're just as dangerous as any other drug. But, you know, Elvis, because of taking those opiate drugs, uh, had a lot of intestinal problems. And uh, and that's why a lot of times you'd see Elvis, you know, the weight gain, the, the bloat, the face, mm-hmm. things like that was because of those type problems with taking those medications. That's also why you would see Elvis a few weeks later, it looked like he'd lost a lot of weight. But Elvis only gained a lot of weight in the last two or three years of his life. So sometimes I know that the, the media likes to print, make it sound like Elvis had a weight problem his entire career, which he did not. obviously is not true. No, he was a good-looking guy. And, uh, you know, kept that for a long time, uh, slipped for a little bit. But but did he not lose his weight toward the end of his career? Well, Elvis was... Uh, or did he, he balloon pretty, up? He was pretty heavy when he, when he passed away. He was, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, but it certainly wasn't to the extent of some of the numbers that you see reported. I mean, I've seen numbers that's just absolutely ridiculous, saying that he weighed like 350 pounds, and he wasn't anywhere near that number. Was he... Uh, Still performing, you know, before he died? He was. Uh, June 26, 1977 was his last concert in uh, Indianapolis, Market Square Arena. And uh, just six weeks later, sadly, he passed away. So and, his... he was, and the day he passed away, he was about to embark on another tour that was going to start out in Portland, Maine. So his, his death was sudden. He really didn't have any symptoms, or had he had problems, and we just didn't know about it? Well... You know, we didn't have all these social outlets back then for everybody to know everybody's business yeah. about celebrities like we do now. But sadly, Elvis had had problems on and off for a long time. And anybody in the inner circle all knew, you know, what they were being caused from. It's just that the public didn't necessarily always know what was going on with that. But sadly, it never got handled. Corey, yeah, why didn't anybody stop him? Well, they tried. But Elvis was Elvis, and Elvis was very stubborn. And. Elvis had a way that, you know, he'd only take so much, and if you, you keep hounding him about something, he would just fire you. But uh, he, he would also hire everybody back, for the most part. <laughs> but, um, you know, but that's the way Elvis was, and he really felt that he needed, needed those medications. And so it's, it's sad that it took his life. He was generous, was he not? Very, very generous. In fact, uh, one of the most amazing stories, I think, that doesn't get told a lot is the fact that the USS Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor was finished because of Elvis. The uh, State Park Department didn't have the money to finish the memorial, and Elvis did a couple of charity concerts and donated all the proceeds so that could be done. I always heard rumors, Corey, that he was a part of the CIA. What was that all about? Yeah, that's that's what uh, I like to call them, the alivers, and their conspiracy theories that try to say that uh, that's why Elvis 
is still alive and had to fake his death because he had to go into witness protection because of his ties to the CIA and all of course is you know not based on any fact at all because it didn't happen but what they try to make the connection to was there was a group of men that were going around uh, shafting people out of investment money over airplanes and they try to make that connection that that Elvis had something to do with them and that he had people implanted in his band that were trying to find out things and then he just it was all a bunch of nonsense, but they like to use this to say that that's why Elvis had to fake his death, because he had mafia hits on him. Uh, and, you know, there's no truth, no basis in fact at all. Here we are, 40 years since he died, and his name is still going strong, isn't it? Definitely. I mean, you can't go a week without hearing, seeing some kind of reference to Elvis. I mean, it's amazing. You'll turn on the TV and I'll have something that has absolutely nothing to do with Elvis or music, and somebody will mention his name or a song will be playing in the background. I mean, we'll still play a bumper song every once in a while. I mean, it just, he lives forever when it comes to that. He certainly does, you know, and, and you know, 40 years later, there's every once in a while, there'll still be some kind of new alternate recording that comes out or some kind of new footage that the estate will put out there, you know, trying to keep something out there fresh for the fans that they've never seen or heard before is the estate making money Corey? oh yeah the estate's still going strong they just opened up a uh, brand new uh, 450 room hotel across the street from graceland called the guest house and it's like a whole giant entertainment center which the, the estate owns it the estate owns it, which is uh, probably doing very, very well this week considering this is elvis week <laughs> and it just opened just a few months ago and they have Every kind of museum and everything across the street there, it's a whole giant complex that they've done. Stay with us. We're coming back for more with Corey Cooper as we talk about the life of Elvis Presley right here on Coast to Coast AM. We're talking about the life of Elvis Presley. Forty years ago, he died. Corey Cooper with us. Corey's website, ElvisExpert.com, linked up at Coast to Coast AM.com as well. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Corey Cooper with us as we talk about the life of Elvis Presley as we celebrate the anniversary. Forty years ago today, he passed away. Did he ever live in, in the Los Angeles area, Corey, or did he spend his time primarily at Graceland? Well, his primary residence was Graceland, of course. But no, Elvis had numerous homes in the Southern California area, in Bel Air, Beverly Hills, uh, Palm Springs. Um, he had four or five different homes over the years. You say he did not go out often, uh, so he wasn't one of those types. Like Sinatra loved to be seen in public um, at restaurants and nightclubs and places like that. Elvis was more of a hermit, wasn't he? Yeah, and a lot of that, I mean, it wasn't because, you know, a lot of people like to say, you know, he was a prisoner of his own fame, and to a certain extent he was. But, uh, you know, Elvis still went out and did what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. I think that's one reason why he stayed in memphis because he probably had a little bit more freedom there than he would uh you know in bel-air tell me about the memphis mafia who are they well the memphis mafia was a the group of uh, friends uh, that elvis would hire that they had protected him uh it was his inner circle uh they were they were always around him i mean there was you know always something that needed to be done for elvis there was always some job to do and of course he needed protection and uh you know it's funny during the break i was just thinking Sadly, you know, they're all getting to that age that so many of them have passed away. And just in the last year or so, there's been four or five members of the Memphis Mafia that's passed away. And then two of the most famous, Red and Sunny West, who were cousins, uh, they passed away within two months of each other. Oh, geez. A couple months ago. And uh, it's just amazing. It's just, you know, they're all, everybody's getting up in that age. And they're all, all going. And now all these fantastic first-hand accounts of all this history with Elvis is all... It's all going to be gone. Elvis would be 82 as well, would he not? Absolutely. Would he still be singing, do you think? You know, I think Elvis would have never totally left show business. I think, obviously, he couldn't have kept up with the touring schedule that he was doing. But I, I think Elvis would have finally got some of those meteor acting roles he would have liked. I think Elvis would have done uh, a lot of music producing. Elvis had a great ear for the music. And I think he would have done a lot of producing and and in and, and the occasional show here and there. Like, he definitely would have kept his hand in it. 
I do uh, a song at my live events, uh, Can't Help Falling in Love, Corey, and uh, it, uh, it, it it's fun for me to do that. And um, I even get some emails afterwards. People said, you are lip-syncing Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great tune, and that's the, that's the song Elvis always ended his concerts with in the 70s. He was one of a kind, and... Uh, what, he had a kind heart, though, as we were talking about his generosity. I mean, remember those stories about he would give away pink Cadillacs to people? Well, yeah, I mean, Elvis was just amazing in the things that he did. I mean, Elvis would read a newspaper, he'd hear somebody's in dire straits, you know, and he would send him a check. You know, there was a lady one time that, had, that needed a wheelchair. She actually was using roller skates to get around her house. Oh, my gosh. And, and Elvis at that time went and, and got the, the most expensive, best wheelchair you could possibly get and hand-delivered it to her. Uh, you know, the Cadillacs giving away the car. You know, there's a documentary out called 200 Cadillacs, which is the estimated number of Cadillacs that Elvis bought during his lifetime. And on one such shop, shopping spree... There was a lady that was looking at one of the Cadillacs, and Elvis had just purchased it, and he told her, he said, well, he goes, you can't have that one, I just bought it, but you can have this one, and he bought her a Cadillac. <laughs> you know, and she was just walking down the street, and then on top of it, he gives her $500, because he said, now you have a new car, you need to go get some new wardrobe, so I here's love $500. It. I love it. Did he have a temper at all, Corey? Oh, yes. Elvis well, he did. He had a temper. But like I said, you know, he would you know he would fly off the handle, fire people, but he'd always hire him back. He was very loyal. But uh, you, gosh, you got to think of the tremendous pressure it must have been to be Elvis. I mean, you know, I mean, look what we do in our own lives. We get stressed out. We have anxiety. Can you imagine all the people that were employed because of Elvis and the enormous pressures, he deadlines and recording and touring and everything that he had to do? You know, it's, it's amazing. Well, we when he went into the service. I remember the video and the film of him getting his hair cut and, uh, you know, all the crooners just going crazy. Um, but he did his part. He did his part for America, didn't he? He absolutely did. He wanted no special treatment. He wanted to do what every other soldier was going to do. He could have absolutely went into a music division and just for two years just went from bass to bass playing music and entertaining the troops, but he didn't do that. He never sang and did one show at all during his two-year stint. And he wanted to be like everybody else. He pulled watch and, and did everything. Will there ever be another Elvis Presley? Nah, George, there can't be. Because what, what Elvis did, that one single point in time could never be accomplished again. To make that breakthrough in music, to make that impact in music, and be that historical at the time, it could, it could just never be done again. I mean, just about everything that's been done in music has already been done. So you can never, you can never have that pivotal point again to have another Elvis Presley. What would he say about music today? Well, you know, Elvis used to say, you know, he was pretty liberal when it came to, to other artists and such. So I'm sure there would be stuff he would like, and some they might not as much. But uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't too jealous when it came to other artists. Uh, a little bit with the Beatles he was for a while, but he even he even came to like them and understood their importance and talent and actually recorded four or five Beatles songs. But, <laughs> you know, he, he knew there was enough to go around for everybody. Did he know the Beach Boys? Uh, you know, I don't know. If that's that's a good one. You, you've actually got me on that one, George. I don't know if he ever met any of the Beach Boys. I, w I would have to say at some point maybe he did, but I, I don't know in the Beach Boys. I ran into Mike Love in St. Louis uh, back in April of this year. He was here for some reason with his with his wife, and I put him in touch with Russ Regan, who discovered the Beach Boys. They were called originally the Pendletons. They named themselves after a shirt, <laughs> and and Russ said, "Oh no no no, that name's not going to last." And he called them the Beach Boys. But I put them in touch with each other. They hadn't spoken with each other. I, I should have asked him about Elvis because that would have been a kick to see if they really knew each other and what they thought of each other. You know, I, I see Mike Love once in a while because he uh, he, he lives uh, near us up in Tahoe. And so uh, and the next time I see him somewhere, I'll, I'll have to pose that question. Yeah, that would be something. And then uh, tell him uh, I said hi from St. Louis. That was fun. The The music that Elvis composed... Did he write it 
most of it, or did people do that for him? No, Elvis didn't write any of his out of his music. And he I know did that, not. Okay, I know. Sometimes uh, that's a bone of contention with a lot of people. But you know, anybody that says that doesn't realize how the music business works. I mean, most artists don't write all their own material, if any at all. And there's always a team of songwriters. That's why everybody that's a songwriter moves to Nashville. That's right. Not everybody's like Paul Anka, for example. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Elvis got a little, little bit of credit on a few songs. You'll see his name listed as a writer, but that was just done for for royalty purposes on a few records. But, you know, Elvis didn't Elvis didn't write anything. But like I was saying earlier with the producer, Elvis, Elvis had that, that perfect ear and knew what to do with a song and what to be needed to be changed and everything. So I really think he would have been great as a producer who did he idolize as a musician well he liked roy hamilton he liked jackie wilson chuck berry uh chuck berry he liked uh all the anybody that was in gospel he liked uh he was big you know in fact the, the only grammys that elvis presley ever won here's the king of rock and roll and all three grammys he won was for gospel music really isn't that amazing that is amazing and only nominated 14 times Kind of makes you wonder about what's going on with the Grammys when you see performers out there today huh. that win five or six in one show. Did he ever get nominated for an Oscar for his movie roles? No. Uh, he got a Golden Globe for one of the, uh, the his documentaries, uh, Elvis on Tour, from 1972, but that, that was it. And, of course, he dated some incredible women, uh, superstars. Uh, he did a movie with Anne Margaret. And um, married Priscilla, of course. Uh, he was seems like he was a decent guy. Yeah, and, and he, he really was. I mean, I've been researching and, and and been in this business for forty years with Elvis, and and you will be hard pressed to find anybody that he worked with, co stars, uh, other musicians that, that have anything bad to say about Elvis because he just really was. The kind Southern gentleman who always had his manners and said, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and, and he really was that person. What was it, Corey, that captured you? How did you get involved in all this? You know, I was a little kid. I I, I saw him or heard him somewhere, and it just stood out. I remember my mom bought me an album, and, and my mom and all her side of the family was in the music business, so I was I was always around music, and I just he just stood out. He just stood out, and then when I got older enough to comprehend what he was all about and learn the history of him. I, I just devoured everything I could. When he died, were you crushed? Yeah, because I was only nine years old when he passed away, and I never got the chance to see him live. Yeah, I never saw him live either. I, I would saw him a lot on television. Uh, I always remember him coming out in that white outfit of his. And uh, that Vegas-looking outfit, and what guy? I mean, it was almost like Liberace outfits. What what got him to start dressing that way? Well, you know, when he went back to the live performing in, in 1969 in Vegas, he wanted to have an outfit that he could move in, and it would move with him, and it would be comfortable. So he kind of modeled it, the, the suit sort of after like a karate gi, and. You know, so that's he, that's what he liked. You know, and of course, if you see the early, early ones, 69, 70, 71, they're not quite as lavish as the later ones. You know, a lot of them have a little bit of macrame, the belt, a little fringe here and there, but they're mainly white. And then later on, you'll see more of the, the different colored rhinestones and different patterns and things like that. But he wanted something he could move in and, and do his dance moves. You know, he did a lot of karate moves on stage to the songs, and he just he wanted to be comfortable. <laughs> he was one of the first celebs to have the polio vaccine, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. That's another a little known fact about Elvis. When uh, Dr. Jonas Salk was uh, researching the polio vaccine, Elvis is one of the first celebrities to ever endorse the research for it, and, and Elvis was the first celebrity to ever be inoculated with the polio vaccine. No, uh, no uh, ramifications from the vaccine, I guess. Absolutely not, and that's why Elvis did it. He wanted to show, hey, it's safe, I'm getting it done, and wanted people to realize how important it was. Did he Did he have best friends in the business? He, he had very, very limited, very limited. You know, he, he, like we were speaking earlier. He really was an introvert, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he basically wanted to just surround himself with the people that he knew 
that he grew up with, went to high school with, a lot of the people that he employed, he was in the military with, and and that's what he did. He surrounded himself with family and friends. He he wanted that little nucleus, but it also didn't mean that Elvis wasn't open to meeting new people. I mean. Elvis was infamous to go down to the gates of Graceland or even to his homes in Southern California and go down and talk to total strangers and invite them up to the house. Invite them right on in and, and <laughs> give them lunch, watch TV, sing for them, tell them stories, read stories to them. I mean, he was, he was very accessible and open that way, something that obviously can't be done nowadays if you're a celebrity. Yet in Vegas, he would do his show and then just disappear, I guess, right? Well, and you got to think, too, absolutely. I mean, you know, he'd go up to the 30th floor suite and just be exhausted. And Elvis was on a schedule where he would do two shows a night. Sometimes a third show he would do at 3 a.m. that would be for all the employees and the people that couldn't see him during the times of the other wow. shows. And so you got to think he's putting 100% of everything into every one of those shows and doing two or three a night like that, you know, and, and, the, and getting Vegas throat, as they would call it, with the dryness out there and, and, and just putting it all out like that. I mean, this has been heard of. I don't think you're going to see any performer doing a 3 a.m. show in Vegas. Corey, was he medicated? Well, sadly, he was from time to time, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of pain type medications, a lot of uh, things to go to sleep, and then of course I'd have to take something to stay awake, and um, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, medications like that. You know that clip I'm talking about where he seemed incoherent when he was singing. I think, "Are you lonesome tonight?" Or that yeah, may have been the song. That's actually uh, that's from 1977, I believe, is the clip that you're thinking of. There's one where he's sitting at a piano as well. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, you know, forgetting the words of the songs where you'd have to read off the paper a little bit. And, you know, the amazing thing with all that, as sick as he was and under those medications, his voice was just as strong as ever. It was strong, and it seemed like even though he messed up the words or forgot them or mumbled them, the audience, when he hit his notes, still applauded. They, they went wild. No, absolutely. I mean, Elvis could do no wrong in their eyes, and, of course, you know, many might have suspected, but you know, people just didn't know what was going on with him, too. You know, it was only a little sprinkle here and there sometimes with a critic that would review a show or something that something might be might be in the media. Or maybe once in a while, Rona Barrett from the tabloid or something would have something in there. But it, it wasn't, wasn't much. So a lot of everything with Elvis was a shock when he passed away for a lot of fans to learn. Corey, if you were to have met Elvis before he passed... What would you have asked him? You know, I'd just ask him if he uh, want to go play some racquetball and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of his favorite sports. I, I just would have just been neat just to, just to hear him talk, just to stand there and hear him talk and just see what he was all about in person. He had one child? One child, Lisa Marie. Where is she now? Uh, she spent her time between Memphis and Southern California as well. She did live in England for a while, but I'm not sure if she is still going over there or not. She's part of the estate, I take it? Yes. Uh, in 2005, she sold off an 85% uh, stake in Elvis Presley Enterprises, but that was only for the image and likeness rights. She still 100% owns Graceland and the property, and all of Elvis's, uh, you know, effects and everything that's there is all hers. And Priscilla Presley, is she still around? Priscilla's still around. She still has her hand in, in the, the day-to-day businesses of Graceland. Were they married when he died? No. No, they had divorced uh, in 72, and or in 73 was became official, and Elvis passed away four years later. And he was only married once, right? Just the one time to Priscilla for about six years. and But they still remained close. They still had talked all the time. They were still friends. They just they just couldn't be married. Interesting take. Well, stay with us, Corey. We're going to come back in just a moment uh, with our final hour here on Coast to Coast AM. And we're going to take phone calls for you. Uh, the lines are already jammed, as a matter of fact, as we talk about the life of Elvis Presley, this being the 40th anniversary. He passed away on August 16th, which is what it is now, 1977, 40 years ago. Wow, how time flies. If you were around then, you probably remember where you were. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. Corey Cooper with us. Corey, is there still a demand from media regarding Elvis? 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, Elvis is still in the spotlight out there. I mean, I just, it's been 40 years, and as you just saw in the, during the, her on the break, they expect the biggest crowd ever at Graceland in Memphis this week for Elvis Week. So definitely that interest is still there. And as the younger generations start finding out about who he is and what he was all about, um, their interest is going to want to take them to Graceland as well. So I don't, I don't see this dwindling anytime soon. I, I, w- I was going to say, younger people are starting to tune in to who Elvis was, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, and, and a lot of, I mean, so many other artists out there now that were influenced by Elvis, too. And a lot of the fans of those people want to know who they were influenced by and it always seems like a direct link right back to Elvis. what did he have a pet peeve was there anything that really aggravated the guy uh you know Elvis didn't get into politics so that wouldn't be one uh, i just think that uh, not having a sense of loyalty would be a big one for Elvis. you mean people loyal to him yeah, yeah i mean and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way but i just that you know Elvis Elvis wanted his friends to be his friends and be loyal and and you know there was a couple times over the years that people that he trusted had really burned him and he had to uh ah. you know get rid of them and you know find out that they had stole money from him or jewelry things like that personal possessions and that that type of stuff really really would hurt him cuz i would guess he would have a lot of people over that mansion <laughs> absolutely <laughs> You know, have you ever been there, George? No, I've never been to Graceland. I'd like to go see it. Is well, it a big-looking place or, or what? Well, that's what I was going to say if you'd ever been there, because it's, it's very deceiving when you see it in pictures and then when you're there in person, because you expect it to be a lot bigger than it is. You know, it's like so many things. When you go back and look at your old house that you grew up in as a kid, you thought it was much bigger, and then when you look at it, you go, wow, look how little it is. Yeah, it definitely it is. It is it's a big. It's a big enough house, but it's just you know you would think it just it just seemed like it would just be monstrous. Did he I mean, build that house or or did he buy it? No, no, he bought that in in 1957. He bought that for his for his parents. Um, it had actually been built in 1939 and had been on that property uh, for a long time. But it was actually even used for a church at one point. How did it get that name, Graceland? Uh, it was named after. Uh, the, the doctor that built it, he named it for his daughter. Ah, okay. And Elvis liked the name, so he kept it. He, so he just kept it. It's, it's cool. And then uh, how often was he in Memphis as opposed to L.A. or Vegas? Well, it would certainly depend on the time frame. Like in the 60s with the filming of the movies, Elvis was in, in California a lot with that. But uh, Elvis would always always go back to Memphis after those that were done, or in the tours Elvis would go on, he'd always go back home to Memphis as well. So, you know, most of his time in all of his homes was spent in Memphis. Was Colonel Parker a dear friend of his as well, or just an agent? Uh, I don't think, I don't, a dear friend wouldn't be the, the, the wording I would use. I mean, obviously he was Elvis's advisor and, and manager, and Elvis would go to him for advice on numerous occasions, but they, they, Strictly kept it business. You know, Elvis didn't really hang out with Parker. Parker didn't really hang out with Elvis. As soon as the tour was over, they kind of go their separate ways. You know, but they still would keep in contact. But they they didn't they didn't really socialize all that that much together. It was pretty much just a business deal between them. Corey, how come we don't hear much about Elvis's father? Well, sadly, Elvis's dad passed away about two years after Elvis did, and so. You know, he wasn't around all that that much longer to be interviewed or to be on shows. Or did he? Was he married to Elvis's mother for a long time? Well, uh, Gladys Elvis's mom passed away in August of 1958. Oh, that's pretty and, early then. Yeah, yeah, and then and then Vern and Elvis's father remarried in 1960. Um, Elvis and his stepmom didn't have the greatest of relationships, so that didn't really go all well. Did Elvis have any brothers or sisters? He had a twin brother, brother Jesse Garen, that, that was stillborn. Ah, okay. Which kind of led to the closeness and the relationship that Elvis had with his mother, Gladys, because he was now an only child. He was it. That was it. Was he good in school? Uh, he was okay in school. Uh, you know, he wasn't a terrible student, but he wasn't necessarily an honor roll student either. Did he play sports? 
he tried to play football for a little while, but uh, the the coach wanted him to cut his hair and and look like the other huh. kids, and Elvis didn't necessarily want to do that. Where did he get that little slogan? Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I, I think it was just just something he uh, liked to say to the audience, and it just stood out there. And it's one of those you no know, pop culture iconic references that we hear all the time. <laughs> it really is. It's like Johnny Cash's "I'm Johnny Cash." That yeah, kind and, of thing. Yeah, and you know, and then of course, you know, Elvis didn't say this, but we, what else do we always hear all the time too? Is that Elvis has left the building? Exactly. Exactly. How did that happen? Uh, Al Devoren, who was uh, one of the people that worked on Ellis's uh, tours, uh, said it one night to try to alleviate mass hysteria with the crowds and people trying to get to Elvis, and basically said, you know, Elvis has left the building in an attempt to let people know, hey, he's not here anymore, so don't freak out trying to find him. And then it just became a staple after every show. I love it. We're going to take calls now. And if anybody ever met Elvis, try to check in with us. I'd love to know how that went. Philip is driving in Nevada. Welcome to the show. Hi, Philip. Hi, guys. Hey, um, there's two things that you might find interesting. And the third I'll tell you about that I think proves he could still be alive. All right, right? go ahead. Uh, the first one is that Elvis actually was born a twin. And his twin brother died in childbirth. Yep. And what's fascinating about that is apparently there is some speculation that throughout the course of his life, he was trying to make up for that and actually maybe attempting to channel uh, that uh, the counterpart's uh, experience. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing mm-hmm. um, as it relates to him. Also, too, in his early childhood, there was a comic book character, and I forget what it is, who this this person was, but maybe you can Google this. But anyway, this comic book character looked exactly like the later Elvis in adulthood. And it's fascinating. He had a cape and everything. And Elvis was known to uh, read that with uh, regularly and, you know, try to take on aspects of the character that was in that comic book. So if you can find that, I don't remember what it is, but it's kind of fascinating. And then the third huh. thing is, if you guys, George, if you Google the Home Alone movie, the first one, where the housewife is standing at the airport in line just before she meets John Candy. Okay. Uh, ride home, look off to her left or our right as a viewer, and you will see Elvis Presley standing there. I'm not kidding you. This is all over <laughs> okay. the internet. If you get a chance... And what know. year was that first movie made? Oh, boy. I'm thinking 1990, maybe. All right. So well after he died, apparently. But a friend of mine just put this on to me oh, maybe two or three months ago, and I looked at that, I holy mackerel, and... Uh, there's no claim in the film whatsoever of who this person is. It's just a person that's standing in line kind of to her left from her perspective, but our right as a viewer. Look that up. Does it look like it's a movie extra, or they were just randomly yeah. taking film shots of people? Yeah. I don't know, and nobody knows, and there's a big mystery surrounding it, but look at that guy and show it to your guests. I think... He'll get a major kick out of it. All right, very good. Have, have you seen that, Corey, at all? Yeah, what do you speak of? It's an extra in that movie. And and when they stop the camera and then have a still of it, it in certain angles, it sort of kind of does resemble Elvis. But I've actually seen an interview with that extra, and the man looks nothing like Elvis. It's just a, you it's, know, it's just it's a weird just camera. It's kind of weird, I mean, yeah. I mean, again, Elvis passed away in 1977, so he's absolutely not... Not standing with a beard in disguise at the, in the Home Alone movie. Was the uh, was was the uh, funeral open casket? Yes, it was. And you know, and, and good point made too there, George, is that you know twenty thousand people, you know, walked by the casket to see Elvis uh, in it as well. So, yeah. I mean, what a sad story, though. My gosh, Corey, forty-two years old. Well, at what when he died. Where was he peak wise in his career? Well, he was still obviously very popular. He was about to embark on a sold out concert tour. Uh, you know, he I mean, was he going a, up, going down, well, flat? He, he Where was, was he? I mean, he definitely was wasn't at the pinnacle of what his career had been, but he was 
you know, it slowed down recording. But he just had a, an album came out, Moody Blue, that was doing quite well in sales, and the tours were still selling out. So, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to say that he was fading, but, you know, he definitely wasn't in the pinnacle of his career anymore, but he was still in a pretty steady career. Let's go west. Rogers in uh, Payson, Arizona now. Hey, Rog, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Sure. Um, I was always wondering, uh, and there have been a lot of queries uh, regarding the uh, misspelling of Elvis Presley's middle name on his tombstone. Well, uh, how that happened is uh, as simple as that, a simple misspelling. Um, in some places you'll see the spelling as, as one A, A-R-O-N. Others you'll see it with a double A. Uh, what had happened is that Elvis uh, always wanted the biblical spelling of Aaron, which would be with the two A's. Uh, when Elvis went to actually get that changed through Shelby County, uh, he found out that it actually had been spelled that way on the record. So in some papers, depending on, on what era it is of Elvis's life, you'll see that he used to spell his name with the one A, and sometimes it's the, the two A. But for all historic purposes, the estate uses the double A spelling, and that's why it's on his gravestone. I, I think a lot of people, too, think Elvis uh, faked his death or something like that because of the mystery around Paul McCartney and that whole Beatles conspiracy. Remember that one? Yeah, absolutely. As in, in, When you have uh, our Gary Patterson on as well, he, he when he goes deep into that story, it's very uh, interesting, but... You know, and, and has, you know, and, and Gary's great how he leaves it up to the to the listener or the reader of the book to make their own determination. But. Gary was. Did you know he just passed away? Oh my gosh, I did not know. Yes, that. yes, he just died. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. We, to hear that, we as a matter of fact, guy. I was just talking to Tom about that, saying we are lacking an expert in the music field, and he said, "Well, you know, Corey may be the one." Yeah, it's sad, sad story. He was just with us at a live state show event, and then uh, he passed on. I, 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 I didn't even know he was sick. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, Gary was a was a very, very neat man and very knowledgeable, and boy, he was a absolutely fantastic guest every time you had him on. Oh, my, my God, yeah, we miss him a lot. Let's go next to Rick in Phoenix, Arizona. Go ahead, Rick. You're on with us. Yes. Thanks, George and Corey. Maybe you can help me understand what it is about these stars, this charismatic quality that they seem to have from something in their upbringing, like uh, being a twin and an only child or or insecure. And sometimes these stars look almost effeminate. The, the men have a sort of effeminate quality. What what What's some of the qualities that make them have this effect on women and just be so exceptional? Well, I think with Elvis was the, the complete uniqueness. I mean, nobody looked like him in the, in the style that, in the, that he wore, you know, and the smile and just that, that aura that he had. He just, and he was a good-looking guy. He was a good-looking guy. He, you know, emanated sexuality. You know, he had a great voice. He just had that charm with the women. And, boy, you know, and it, it just worked. And he had money. <laughs> that doesn't hurt either. He, may, he, he, he did well for himself, didn't he? Well, Elvis wasn't as wealthy as you think he might have been, considering that it was Elvis. I mean, Elvis did like to spend money as fast as he made it, and Elvis also didn't really get advised all that well in investing his money. So when Elvis passed away, he only had a little over a million dollars in the checking account and didn't really have any investments other than a little bit in a couple of uh, publishing companies for music. Tony's with us, Corona, California. Hey, Tone, go ahead. Hey, uh, George, good to talk to you again. You uh, too, Tony. I had the opportunity to sing in Elvis Presley's house in the Chino Canyon, and I met uh, Mayborn Axon. That's the lady who wrote Heartbreak Hotel with Elvis on the uh, How cool. music. And uh, I, I sat and talked to her, and she told me the history behind Heartbreak Hotel. It's about a gentleman who committed suicide because of a bad relationship with wow. a lady. Wow. And, uh I really had a good time uh, at Elvis's house over there in Chino Canyon, and uh, he had another house in uh, Palm Springs. Now, was was he there? No, he wasn't. This was uh, when they had the uh, meeting greets that they had uh, in the nineties. Uh, ah, okay, he was already the, gone then. Yeah, the uh, state still owned the house at that time, then they sold it. And uh, what well, what did it feel like being in one of his houses? 
it felt like strange, but I went out to my uh, van and I brought my guitar and I, I sang a <laughs> song from GI Blues. What's your favorite Elvis song, Tony? Uh, probably If I Can Dream, but I also like uh, Can't Help Falling in Love. Yeah, that's a classic. Tony, thanks for that. I love that story. Joe in uh, Long Island, New York. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, Corey. I, I would ask you about his relationship with Anne Margaret, who was supposed to be the female Elvis and, you know, has still had a still going career. And then with Frank Sinatra, uh, he seemed to have much more of a movie career where he was. He seems. It seems like he was a megastar in the movies at the time, but I don't think either one of them got invited to Woodstock, Elvis or Frank Sinatra. I don't think they fit in with that crowd. No. Yeah. Not at all. Then what would Elvis say about the music today, Corey? Well, he, he would like. He would like some more than others. That's for sure. But like, like we've spoke about, you know, he. He knew there was room for everybody, so he was, he'd be pretty uh, liberal and generous when he's thinking when it comes to other artists, for sure. We've got Rick in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hi, Rick. Welcome to the show. Yeah, George. How you doing? Good. Good. Yeah, I just uh, want to share with you and Mr. Uh, Mr. Cooper, I did get the chance to see Elvis live at the Comeback Tour in 1968 at the old Olympia Theater in Detroit. Oh, I remember that. I remember that oh, yeah. well. I don't know if a lot of people, Mr. Cooper probably knows about it, but uh, uh, the uh, movie King Creole was, of course, a Harold Robbins book, The Stone for Danny Fisher. And uh, when it was first being considered for a screenplay, when it was first came out, uh, I think James Dean was considered for the role, but he, of course, died in 56. That's correct. And uh, uh, also Elvis and Bobby Darin also competed for the role of Tony for the 1960 movie West Side Story. Who, and who won that? Bobby Darren? No, no, no. Uh, Richard Boehmer did. Richard Boehmer, Boehmer got, got it. it. Darren oh. and uh, they, they, they felt, I think the, the uh, writers and the uh, producers felt that Darren or and definitely Elvis would take away too much from the movie. Huh. And, and you, might enjoy this, you might enjoy this as well. Uh, can you imagine Elvis as Dirty Harry? Because that's, Elvis was one of the people that was in the running for that role. Can you imagine that? The one that Clint Eastwood got. <laughs> Absolutely. Jeez. That, would have, that would have changed things. That would have been something. Yeah, I, I think back now of the movies Elvis was in. He did a pretty good job acting. Well, you could definitely see it You know, in King Creole, which was Elvis's favorite movie. Uh, you could see his acting chops. You know that you can see it in there. Uh, just you know, after that though, they you know they did so many of them, and you know, and, you know, and they always wanted Elvis to sing, and that's you know, Elvis was trying to get away from that, and he never really did. I mean, he did Charo, which was a western towards the end of his film career, and uh, you know, didn't sing in that. But you know, they just they always made those movie contracts, and he always had to sing five or six songs. Stay with us. We're going to come back in just a moment and wrap things up with final phone calls. Corey Cooper, our special guest, as we talk about the 40th anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Email me at george at coasttocoastam.com. Welcome back to our final segment. George Norrie with you along with Corey Cooper as we talk about the anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley 40 years ago today, August 16th, 1977. My gosh, how, where does the time go, Corey? Yeah, it's just amazing thinking back in that four decades. And uh, gosh, four decades. And how much more music that Elvis had in him that we would have been listening to. It's so sad. You know what? That that is that is true. Was he coming up with any new songs toward the end of his life? Uh, they were, but they it wasn't certainly the catalog to pick from. It was a lot less. He wasn't recording as much. Um, he kind of stopped going to RCA in Nashville to record, and they'd actually just bring the equipment to him and set up in the den, which is the jungle room, and he would record there. Um, it was just kind of a different way how they did the songs. There's a lot of songs that Elvis wanted to do from from other people. He wouldn't be able to get those songs because of the deals that Parker would make with him when it came to giving up certain percentages of the of the rights to the song. So Elvis missed out on a lot of a lot of music that way. That's where the Beatles were very smart. So yeah, it's, 
too bad Ellis didn't take a, a lesson from them with this. But with exactly. Parker and everything, it just wasn't going to be. Back to the phones. Chris is with us, Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the program. Hi, George. I told you a story years ago, and it's good to get an Elvis' anniversary here. I met Elvis in 1972. <clears throat> what it was, I was in Job Corps. We had our military uniforms on with a Job Corps patch on it. Car pulled up at the gate. We'd come down and visit on a 72-hour pass. And where where were you? Uh, there in Graceland. In, okay. In Memphis, you know. And uh, we had our uniforms on, and a car pulled up. A window went down in the back and went down, and actually saw him. Oh, wow, you know, that was cool. And, well, anyway, what we were doing, we were practicing for a parade. We were doing a march like stripes in Job Corps because we were going to do a festival. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're waiting to get a look around the place, and pretty soon the uh, guard comes up and says, my boss wants to talk to you. What did we do wrong, you know? <laughs> you know, and we didn't expect, uh, we went up to the kitchen there, had sandwiches with Elvis, and told him about Job Corps, and we'd heard years later that he'd started something else, a training program for children, for other young people. And uh, he asked us what he, you know, all the guys knew this, about me. He said, well, what do you like about, you all like my music, you know. What do you think of it, you know. I said, we all like except for him, he don't like your damn Kentucky Rain song. <laughs> said, oh, geez. I shrunk down, he said, okay. He says, what, I got to know, he says, what's wrong with my damn Kentucky Rain song? And I told him, I said, well, he said, that song come on the radio, I'm walking in Kentucky in the rain, I open up a letter from home, and it's my girl, and it's Dear John letter. She'd found somebody else. Oh, jeez. And he knows how the song goes, and he got a kick out of it. He just started laughing. He <laughs> said, that's all right, son. <laughs> he said, it happens to all of us, you know. And uh, it was just a wonderful meet. We never thought we was going to meet the guy. But years later after that, I got to meet uh, the son of his pilot and another gentleman who... Uh, his uncle lived in back of Elvis, and he said there was this guy with a motorcycle helmet coming back behind the place there. And he stopped and said, hey, what are you doing there? And it was Elvis. He said, well, I got the helmet on so people won't recognize me. So he actually got out of the house. That was something. And drove in that motorcycle and enjoyed life. I love it. That's a great yeah, I story. I Ricky Nelson because those two were pretty good together. Okay, I'll let you go, George. Thanks, Chris. Great story. I love these stories, Corey. Oh, it's great. It's great to like that. I mean, you got to hang out with Elvis and have a sandwich and talk with him. How fantastic. Well, and it echoes exactly what you were saying about how friendly Elvis was to people. He'd just bring them in. Yeah, he, that's, you know, I think that's part of, the, of his charm. That's what endeared him. He was he, Even though he was the most famous superstar in the world, he was still this normal, down-to-earth guy that was accessible. Did he have a maid and, and somebody like that at the place? Oh yes, he had uh, different maids over the years, but they, you know, they, he always had somebody there. Uh, I believe a couple of them. Pauline was one, and, and Nancy Rooks. They've written some cookbooks over the years. Some of Elvis's favorite stuff that he liked to do. And I, I've met them, and <laughs> they're real fun. It's really neat to talk to them. Let's go to JP in St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, JP, go ahead. Good morning, George. I love the show, and I, Thank you. I, I, I love the subjects you're talking about. I'd like your guest to comment on three quick points. Sure. One is that my understanding is after the colonel died, it was found out he had came into the country at some kind of semi-illegal status, and that is why Elvis had, there was demands, and they begged him to come to Japan, Australia, and around the world, and except for Hawaii and his tour in Germany, he never went out of the country. And the colonel didn't want to, uh, was trying to, he was afraid there'd be some immigration problem for him. So he, he made impossible demands. And so therefore, Elvis never got a tour around the world. Huh. And the second point is about when the Beatles came to California and jammed with him a little bit. And the third point is, I think the voice he admired the most was, I think, another a Southern boy that probably, rec I believe, recorded for Sun was Roy Orbison. Ah, Roy was. That's right. He, uh, yeah, absolutely. Elvis was a big Roy Orbison fan. And you're right about Colonel Parker. He was a, a illegal Dutch immigrant and didn't have the paperwork. 
his real name was Andreas Van Kuyk, and <laughs> he got he got the uh, title of a colonel from a a friend of his that was a governor in Louisiana, and and the Tom Parker part I guess was some friend of his that was in the military. So yeah, he was a he was a true carny, uh, <laughs> Colonel Tom Parker. That's amazing stories. That truly is. Let's go to John in Ontario, Canada, on the international line. John, go ahead. Hello, George. How are you? Good, John. Thank you. Go ahead. I got rid of that uh, echo. Yes, some good evening to your guests. Um, I've spent probably about 15000 on Elvis. In what, music and stuff? Yep. Uh, $15,000, and you still have the collection? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's probably worth something now. I've got some things. Uh, I asked your Gary Patterson one night. Uh, I have some Elvis 45s from Sun Records. You do? Yes, I What do, do you think that's worth, Corey? Well, if he's got some original presents from the Sun Sundays, you... you <laughs> You got some cool collectible uh, items there for sure. You know those prices differ from time to time, but uh, you know if you want to let me know what you have, you can give me an email. Uh, I'm Elvis Expert at AOL dot com, and I can try to lead you in the right direction and get some uh, great pricing on that if you'd like. Good luck, John. Uh, indeed, with collectibles, I guess there are companies that would spin that stuff off for you if you wanted to sell it, right? There is, and a lot of the stuff with over the collectibles now is that anything that's aftermarket, when it comes to Elvis, has been so mass produced and so much of it. There's really none of that type of stuff that's really worth all that much. But uh, if a lot of people, though, if they have original items from the, the summer and winter sessions that Elvis did in Vegas or Lake Tahoe, such as like pennants, you know, the hats, pens, uh, the menus, you know, the, can you imagine this, George? You get a, you go to the dinner show. At, at the Hilton in Vegas, and you, you get a free menu, and just because it has Elvis's picture on it and the dates he was there, you know, it could be worth $1,200, and those are things that you could have just picked up <laughs> stacks of. Oh, my God. Free. Yeah, absolutely. Who would know, right? Absolutely crazy. Tim is in Orange County, California. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you for calling. Yeah, George. Hi there. I really appreciate your show. Thank you. Hey, uh, the reason I called was because my sister-in-law happens to be uh, Dave Hebler's uh, niece, and uh, I guess he guarded Elvis for a couple of years. And uh, with the West Brothers, he ended up writing a book, Elvis, What Happened, which I believe is out of print. They tried to help Elvis get off drugs, but uh, to no avail. And my, my other tenuous connection is, in the 70s, my martial arts instructor had been in that first class with Dave um, that was t- hand-taught by Ed Parker, and he got a, a chance to go up to the house in Tahoe, and, of course, everybody in the martial arts class asked him, well, how was Elvis? And he said uh, basically that uh, Elvis came out and kind of jumped out and said, who wants to spar? <laughs> and kind of, kind of broke the tension and then he said for the rest of the weekend, he was just a very humble, quiet type of guy. So every indication I've ever gotten from anybody that's ever met him was the guy really had a great heart, and he, uh, he was a really nice guy. You know, and he must have been a tiger on the stage and so docile behind the scenes, Corey. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. In fact, that's, uh, that was his uh, martial arts symbol was the tiger tim is in ohio now welcome to the program tim go ahead hi george uh i would like uh an answer uh to the conspiracy theory of the wax dummy uh at elvis's funeral why he looked so young and he did look so young and the conspiracy that it had an air conditioning unit in the bottom of the casket and that's why it weighed so much i'll take my answer off here thank you all right Corey, can you address that Sure, that's been one of the long-standing theories in the conspiracy theory is that that it was a wax dummy and that and that Elvis didn't uh, look like everybody thought that he should have looked like. They'll try to say that he had a his nose looked different or something in the casket, and then you know, I mean, and not to, to get uh, in, in a macabre about things, but you know, after somebody passes away, and, and you know, you're going to look a little different. And of course, they were doing their best to try to make Elvis look as good as he as he could look. 
and you know and, and but there's again no no basis in, in in fact with that and and you know air conditioning units in the casket and look if if they were going to fake Elvis's death the monumental amount of people it would have taken to pull something off like that and here 40 years later that nobody would have came forward out of all the people it would have taken to to do something like that it's just this goes beyond human nature. And, and why? And if you were going to do that, why would you have an open casket and let twenty thousand people shuffle by? And you know what? And I'm sure he had an ego. He loved the roar of the crowd. Once it gets in your system, you can't just give it up like that. I, and and so I don't think he would have. Well, and and another thing too, there was like we were talking earlier. There's no reason for that. Elvis didn't work for the CIA. You know, he wasn't going to testify in court against mobsters. You know, that's, you know, I, I've seen the, what's in the FBI files. You know, there's nothing like that in there. And so, you know, it's just, it's just tabloid fodder. And it's just, you know, but, but, but it keeps Elvis's name out there and people are still interested in first, it. First time caller is Tom in Fort Worth, Texas. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, yes. Hi, George. And Hi there. Corey. Hi. Well, my story is just one, uh, I remember it was about like late June of 1977, and I picked up a copy of Rolling Stone magazine at a uh, newsstand, and uh, there was a section in there they used to call Random Notes. And uh, there was just a small item in there that was talking about uh, a concert Elvis was in, and uh, in the middle of the concert, he suddenly became sick, and they had to take him backstage and revive him or resuscitate him, and then so after delay... And the audience just waited outside, out in the uh, uh, theater, wherever it was at, and then he finally came back out and resumed his performance and finished the concert. And I wish I'd say the issue, but I didn't. And I huh. remember thinking at the time, you know, uh, gee, I wonder what's the matter with him. And then, uh, and then I just kind of pretty much uh, dismissed it until like about a month and a half later, you know, when I heard the news of what happened to him. Did you ever hear that one, Corey? Uh, there was times, you know, sometimes he might need some oxygen on the side of the stage or things like that, and other times, you know, he was just exhausted. I mean, I, I have heard stories, you know, a little bit here and there about that. I don't know about that one specifically that he mentions. But, uh, you know, there was definitely some issues going on the last few months of his life, sadly. I, Willie Nelson was 84 years old, just had uh, an episode in Salt Lake City where uh, he says the atmosphere, the, uh, the you know, the... the uh, levels uh got to him he he couldn't breathe gosh yeah and you got to think you know <laughs> you know all the all that tour you know you're just not on a normal schedule and somebody up in an age like that too boy it's really got to be rough william is with us in cheyenne wyoming hey william go ahead hey how you doing george love Great. the program thank um, you just wanted to uh, mention that my aunt my aunt mary marguerite Calius went to high school with elvis Huh. And she was in charge of talent in high school, and they discussed him, you know, performing on the, in the talent show and whatnot. And he did, obviously, and, you know, became a great person, you know, a great performer. But um, as well, we used to have a, oh, we used to have a, uh, a yearbook, my aunt's yearbook. She's passed now, but, and it was signed by Elvis, uh, the Humes High um, yearbook and it said to a cutie Elvis Presley. Oh, that's got to uh, be worth emotional stuff at least. Huh? Yeah, yeah. He, he used to ride her home from high school to the house um, on his little Cushman, his little Cushman uh, scooter. <laughs> so, but you know, back then it was no big deal because he hadn't, you know, hasn't risen, risen to fame and all that. You right. know, and he, he was just Elvis. Right. right, just Elvis. Exactly. Exactly. So. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Cool story. Show. I love it. Great, George. All, all these, all these stories. Everybody has these warm remembrances of Elvis, and that, that's what that's what has endeared him to the fans. You know, you just hear these good things about Elvis, and it's sad he only lived to be forty-two. But boy, look at what he left us to entertain us with in those forty-two years. Well, and what's so amazing, Corey, is uh, the CDs and the records. They all live forever, don't they? They, they definitely do. In the movies, you know, we can put on a. Elvis Elmer put in an Elvis movie and smile and, and enjoy what he gave us. And that's what it's all about. And that's why everybody gathers every year in Graceland to, to commemorate that life. Corey, keep in touch with us, okay? Absolutely. And, uh, and if anybody needs to get a hold of me, Elvis Expert at AOL.com. Thank you, you George, it. so much. Thank, Thank you, you Corey. The 40th anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley, who died on August 16th. 
1977. Ah, it just seems like it was yesterday. 40 years have blown by already. And I'm, uh, I'm talking about how fast this year goes. Wow. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Lottasor, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, and George Knapp, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.